Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Shimon Tiger, also called Legolas, or just Lego for short. And we are going to look at the problems that cause the most trouble. Uh, we are going to start with the easier ones, and as we move on, the problems would get harder. Um, I, I apologize for my grammar. It's, it's not as good as it should be, but I hope it won't be so, such a problem. Anyway, definitely, definitely the easiest problem that caused serious troubles to many of you is the problem M3. Also, uh, the uh, restless washing machine. Uh, so the problem is that we've got a washing machine and it is rotating with a frequency F and there is some laundry inside, but it, the laundry is not perfectly balanced as all things should be, but the center of mass of uh, the laundry is in this is rotating in distance r from the axis of the washing machine. And the question is, um, what is the minimal mass of the washing machine required it uh, required so the washing machine won't bounce? Um, well, uh, the the problem is stating we can assume that uh, washing machine doesn't move in any other direction than just up and down. So, uh, so otherwise the problem would be really hard. So, so we can just focus on this vertical direction. Um, well, in the order to Andre to move in in the circle there must be some centripetal force acting on it and uh, causing it to do so. So uh, the value of this uh, force can be calculated as mass of, of an object, angular frequ frequency squared times the distance between the center of mass and the axis exactly that that r that is here mass is just the mass of our laundry that's in the problem and angular frequency that's just shortcut for uh, two times pi times the actual frequency so the the value of the centripetal force required to laundry to move in in the circle is m times 4 times pi squared f squared r. All right, and when the washing machine starts to jump, well, uh, when the laundry is at the bottom, um, the washing machine has to push it up. So that's okay, washing machine can just push the laundry up. But when the laundry is at the top, the washing machine has to push the laundry to the bottom to, in order to, to laundry to maintain that uh, circular tra trajectory. Uh, and the maximal force uh, the washing machine can push down is equal to its weight. So, so the gravitational force pulling the washing machine down. So M mass of the washing machine times G. And, and this is exactly the mistake most of you made. Uh, because the washing machine is not the only thing acting on the laundry. There is also a gravitational force pulling the laundry downwards. So if 
we say that the centripetal force is just so this FC. Um, and then there is some gravitational force pulling the laundry downwards equal to weight of the laundry, of course. Um, for the washing machine has to put just the rest of, yeah, has to push just with the, the, just the difference of these forces. So actually the centripetal force is equal to the force uh, washing machine pushing the laundry down plus the actual weight of the laundry. And this is now correct. And we just evaluate the mass. Oh, this is, this is the maximal force the washing machine can push the laundry down. And so we can just evaluate the minimal uh, mass of the washing machine required to uh, to just stay <laughs> on the ground and not bounce is if we do it, it is m times uh, uh, just some algebra here Am I right? It seems I'm right. So this is the answer. <laughs> the minimal required mass of the version machine so it won't jump, um, so whatever. Do we have any questions? Or? Okay. Um, just to remind you, there is a slide where you can put your questions if you have any. But for now, we will move on to the problem uh, from the series about thermodynamics. Actually, the first one, uh, T1, also called drinking water. The problem is that Danka has a bottle, a glass bottle, uh, and yeah, besides, I. I'm not so very good at English grammar. I'm really, really bad in drawing pictures. So let's imagine this is a glass bottle, okay? Uh, and it has total volume, volume of bottle. And at the beginning, there was some volume of water. It's denoted V1, I suppose. Yep. And the pressure of the air inside of the bottle is just equal to atmospheric pressure at the beginning. Then Danka drank some of the water and uh, volume of the drank water is denoted V zero or O. And the question is how much the pressure inside, uh, the pressure of the air inside the bottle decreased if we assume Danka did not breathe in or out any other air. And, and also we assume that uh, Danka drank that water quite quickly. So no, uh, no heat exchange uh, happened. Why is it important to consider this? Well, uh, if Danka would drink the water slowly, so the heat exchange could have could have happened, uh, the temperature of that air would stay the same. Uh, so the, that would be isothermic process. But as the uh, problem is saying, this is not what happened. Uh, the, the process that happened was uh, adiabatic, that's 
that's the process defined that by that uh, we have no heat exchange during the process. So that's probably the mistake most of you, no, many of you made. That you did not consider the right thermodynamic process process that the air inside the bellow undergo is adiabatic. Okay, and for, for this process, you can Google quite easily or der derive not so easily uh, that uh, pressure of the gas times its volume raised to the power of kappa. Uh, many people denote the kappa also uh, gamma. Um, is constant during during the whole process, uh, where uh, kappa is also known as Poisson's constant or uh, the capacity ratio, and it was not directly stated in the pro problem what the value of kappa is, but in the problem was stated that we can assume that air has uh, F five degrees of freedom. And you can again <laughs> probably Google that uh, this person con person's constant is equal to degrees of freedom plus two over the number of degrees of freedom. In our case, that's seven over five, that's 1.4, I suppose. So we know that this number, the pressure times the volume raised to the this number should stay constant during the whole process. And we, we can calculate uh, this number at the beginning because we know that at the beginning there was atmospheric pressure inside the bottle and the volume of the air inside the bottle was just the volume of the bottle minus the volume of the water that was inside the bottle so this raise to the power of kappa and uh, after Danka drank this water, there would be some different pressure, exactly the pressure we want to know. <laughs> uh, and also the volume would be different. Well, it would still be the volume of the bottle minus the volume of the water that was inside the bottle at the beginning, but uh, plus the volume of the water that Danka drank. As Danka drank this water, the volume in volume of air has to decrease, has to increase by that amount. And that raise to the power of kappa. All right. So we just we just Count the, this value of the pressure after then drank this water as uh, all raised to the power of kappa. Okay, but the question is not what the new uh, pressure would be, but what would be the difference between the pressure at the beginning and the pressure at the end. So we just want to know, not the difference, but the decrease. So atmospheric minus the new one, so that's, 
atmospheric times one minus that fraction raised volume of the bottom minus one plus volume of drunk water raised to the power of kappa end of the bracket. So this is the answer. Um, now, what other, other mistakes could you have done? Uh, the, the way the volumes were stated in the problem was a bit confusing. So it's important not to get lost in the conversion of the units. And also the difference was really, really high. So maybe you get confused by that, but uh, always when, well, it was, uh, it was re really high, but always when the number, if, if your result is kind of unrealistic, you, it, it doesn't necessarily mean your result is wrong. It's, it also can be that uh, the values in the problems were just nonsense. And that, that was this case, the, if I'm right, the, uh, the volume of the water, uh, of the air would have, would have be three times the volume at the beginning that, and that's something a human just can do. So that's the reason the pressure was so high. <laughs> Okay, uh, now let's move on to the reason uh, announcement of the results was uh, delayed. We just wanted to make us really sure that we've got this problem right. The problem T5, uh, breakfast in Dukovani. Dukovani is the PowerPoint uh, in the Czech Republic. So the problem is that we've got ourselves some volume of water. We want to make us a tea. Uh, and so we have to heat up that water from its uh, current temperature to the 100 degrees of Celsius, we you know that like this. Yeah, the first um, mistake you could have done is that well, we just want to make a tea. We don't want to vaporize all the water. So we just have to heat up from the 15 degrees of the Celsius it has at the beginning to 100 at the end. We don't want to vaporize it all. Uh, and we want to do that in three minutes. I don't know the three minutes by T max. And as we are in a power plant, we would use uh, some uh, radioactive plutonium. It was plutonium 238, no, some, some radioactive plutonium. <laughs> and um, Let's assume we, we can use 80% of the energy uh, from its decay, from the decay of that plutonium. And also uh, there was stated the, the ener uh, energy from decay of one particle uh, one atom of that plutonium and it's uh, half-life. What is the half-life of radioactive material? Well, it's constant <laughs> defined by, it's, well, it's time it takes uh, to uh, to half in <laughs> half its number. So if we've got N zero of atoms 
of this plutonium. So uh, after time, after some time, uh, we've got the number of plutonium we still have after the time t passes is that a number we had at the beginning times Euler's constant raised to the power of minus logarithm two times that time we let it to decay over its half-life. That's still in the exponent. So if uh, we wait time uh, equal to the half-life, this would be one. So, and e raised to the power of minus logarithm two is one half. So we would have just half of the particles we begin with. Uh, and in the case of this plutonium we had, the half-life is something like uh, 87.7 years. Uh, okay. And the, uh, another important thing when we are dealing with radioactivity is the activity of our radioactive material. And it is defined as derivation of the number of particles. Um, so if you don't know how to derivate, I will just do that for you. Activity in the given time t would be the number of the particles at the beginning times Oh, it's minus that derivation, of course, uh, times logarithm two of two over the half-life times e raised to the power of minus logarithm two over t over half-life times time. And so this activity is telling us how, how many particles do decay in one second. This is what the activity is telling us. Uh, so if we just, yeah, now it's important to notice one thing. Uh, at the beginning, the time should be, would be zero, right? So. The activity at the beginning is equal just, oh, if the, the, this time is zero, e raised to the power of zero is one. So this is our initial, initial activity. Anyway, uh, this logarithm two uh, over uh, the half life is, usually denoted as lambda, but whatever. Okay, uh, and after the three minutes, we were heating up our T, the activity would decrease because, well, now we have less of our radioactive material, but let's just calculate how exactly it, it decreased. So uh, activity at the end, so final, would be, again, the number of particles at the beginning times this fraction times E raised to the power of uh, OK, now. This is the time we were warming up our T. So that's three minutes. This is the half-life of our plutonium, 87 years, almost 88 years. Uh, 
So this number is incredibly small. Now, e raised to the power of zero is exactly one, but e raised to the power of incredibly small number is number incredibly close to one. So this is like almost equal to the initial activity. Oh, this is another problem. <laughs> so we can say the activity during that three minutes we are doing our T actually doesn't change at all because well, you can calculate it really precisely, you will see the difference is nowhere close to affect uh, the, the result we actually need. Uh, so if the activity doesn't change during uh, the whole process uh, and, and the activity is telling us the number of uh, atoms that decay per second, and we mm, have uh, the the um, heat we got from one decay. We can just count the 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 energy of the energy we got from the decaying of the, those particles by, by just multiplying these numbers. So the heat we got is the activity. So the number of particles decayed per second times time. We are and times the heat from the one decay. This is an absolute number of decays. This is energy from one decay. And we also have to multiply it by the ratio of how, how, many, how much energy we, do we actually use, uh, we can use from this. So this is the energy we got, the heat we got from the decay. And so we just said it's equal to the energy we need, uh, the heat we need. Uh, so that's the, uh, I think, oh, well, whatever. Uh, we get the volume of, the, of our rotor times uh, it's, um, times it, mm, kilograms over, 1,000 kilograms over meter, cu cubic meter, uh, times the, the temperature difference we want to heat that water up by. So uh, final temperature minus the temperature at the beginning, uh, that times, uh, mass heat capacity of water that's like 4200 uh, joules per kilogram per uh, degree of celsius and well that's almost everything uh, now we just uh, put that the activity is the number of particles at the beginning times the logarithm of two over the time. And we can calculate the number of particles we need to, uh, to do ourselves a T. Uh, that would be quite the large fraction. Uh-huh. 
times energy from the one, okay. And the times logarithm of two, and this times the half-life. Is it seen on camera? So, this is the number of the particles we need. It's quite a large number, but uh, the problem is asking not for the number of the put on number of the um, atoms of plutonium we need. The problem is asking uh, for the mass of them. So we just have to use to Google more more mass of this. Mm, plutonium and just multiply it by, by that and divide it by Avogadro's constant. And well, now it's important not to get lost in the conversion of the units. For example, don't forget this is in years, this is in minutes, we have to somehow uh, Convert it to the same time, maybe seconds, but it can be any uh, any unit, any time unit. And yeah, I'm not going to go through all this conversion, but um, I would just recommend using um, Excel or some other spreadsheet to do conversions to do to do such a uh, such a such number of calculations just by calculator is really hard <laughs> and I would say not a really wise thing to do. Uh, but I would like to address uh, the units of the heat from the one decay. Uh, in problem there were, uh, that, that, that were stated uh, this number in the units of mega electron volts. Well, the electron volt is the unit of energy and it's the energy uh, that one electron got when we, uh, when we speed it up by uh, potential of one volt. So you have to, you either have to Google <laughs> the conversion between electron volts and joules directly, or uh, you have to Google uh, the charge of one electron and just multiply it by one volt. And that's, uh, that's the energy of one electron volt in joules. Uh, do we have any questions or? It seems yes. So the question is uh, in problem T5, I believe I also had to consider the actual uh, boiling of the water that is uh, also include the latent heat of vaporization in the calculation yeah. of the heat. Why isn't it included in the official solution and only the heat needed to heat the water to 100 degrees Celsius taken? Well. As I said, uh, we want to just make a tea, not to vaporize all the water we are, <laughs> we have. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I don't know what else to say about this. Probably many people had confu got, got confused by this, but maybe we could have done the uh, the problem more clear, but this is this is how cooking. I don't know if you ever made a tea, but <laughs> you don't want to vaporize all the water if you are doing a tea. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on to the problem uh, X three. 
also called uh, poisoned. Uh, in this problem, we got a pond of water. Of the total value we, I suppose, and it got somehow poisoned. Uh, so let's denote the concentration of the poison C. And there is a stream coming into the pond and also stream, stream of fresh water coming into the pond with flow rate of Q and also the stream coming out of it with the, and the problem is saying that the total volume of water in the pond uh, don't, doesn't change. So the stream coming out of the pond has to have the same flow rate as the stream coming into it. And we are asking uh, how much time does it take to concentration of the poison to decrease to one tenth of its initial value. So in the, in the time, zero, the concentration, it's some, let's see, C zero. And we want to know the time when the concentration would be C zero over 10. Okay. So what does the concentration actually mean? Uh, it's just a ratio of the volume uh, of the poison over the overall volume of the pond. So that's kind of the definition. And also uh, the problem says that um, the poison is well mixed. That means that actually if we take any, uh, we don't have to take all the pond. If we take any uh, volume, uh, some, uh, v. we, uh, the volume of the poison inside uh, this volume would be C, the volume of the poison inside this volume would be just the concentration of poison times this volume we took. So, the fresh water is coming to the pond and the water coming out of the pond uh, has to have some poison inside it, right? Because it is, as I said, if we take any <laughs> volume of the water from the pond, well, that's exactly what this, for, um, this stream is doing, it is taking some volume from the pond, the, um, the volume of the poison inside that could be calculated by this. So, uh, and what just, uh, what does the uh, flow rate actually mean? The flow rate is, uh, means that if we multiply the flow rate with some, with some short, uh, oh, with some short period of time, uh, that's uh, the, uh, the, volume of water that flowed from the pond by, by the stream. That, that's what does, uh, what does the flow rate mean? It's, it's the units are uh, liters per second, or just volumes per second. So if we multiply it by time, we get volume. 
And uh, the overall volume of the font doesn't change, but the volume of poison inside it does change. So the question is, how exactly does it change? Well, as I said, in any volume of water, uh, the volume of poison inside is concentration times this volume. So if we multiply both of these sides by uh, concentration, here we get the how much uh, this I get confused in my own notation. Well, let's just forget about this. So the concentration times the volume of water coming out of the pond is equal to the decrease of volume of the poison inside the pond. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and now the concentration is this ratio over here. So we can write that the volume of the poison inside the pond over the volume of whole pond times the flow rate of the stream times some short uh, period of time is equal to minus tiny decrease of volume of the poison inside the pond. So this is differential equation, but don't get too afraid of it. It, it is not so difficult to solve this. Uh, I will show you the method. I, I think the easiest method of solving differential, differential equations that ever. And it's called separation of variables. So at first we have to separate our variables. Um, here we got the tiny uh, difference in the volume uh, of the poison. And we just move the volume of the poison to, to, separate, to separate the variables. We just move this, this thing here. So here we got minus. Also, if there would be any time dependent variable, we would have to move that. Oh, time dependent. And, oh, and if there would be any time in this differential equation, we would have to move that on the side where is the T, but we do not have uh, it anywhere. So let's just write the rest. And now, if these sides are equal, well, I think integrals of them should be also equal. Um, some mathematician would maybe disagree, but honestly, I don't care. Uh, we are physicists over here. So the integrals are really simple. This doesn't depend on time. So, uh, Actually, those two integrals you can really find in any table of integrals there is. <laughs> so this is just, we just multiplied that by time. And this is minus, I, I just, yeah, uh, actually I would, we, I, I somehow that I don't, we don't want to really know what is the volume we, we do want 
to take care about the concentration. So I just uh, put <laughs> this, use this two times in this fraction and we will find out that this is also decrease of concentration over concentration. Uh, and the integral of this is minus logarithm of C. This is not the plus C you should always write after you evaluate uh, indefinite integral. But as we got also, we got already C, I would write the integrational constant as A. And this, we can, this, the difference of the integrational constant from one side and the other. There's no need to use two differential, uh, two integrational constants. If we can also, we can just write the difference. We do not know what this A is so far. Uh, now we want to know the concentration. So we just make raise uh, e to the power, if those sides are equal, e to the power of those sides should be also equal. So on the one side, we've got e to the power of q uh, over volume times t, and that's equal to minus concentration uh, times e to the power of a uh, now uh, the concentration uh, no, 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 no. So many mistakes. So many mistakes. This is one over concentration. E to the power of minus logarithm of concentration is one over the concentration. So if we want now our concentration, that's C is equal to e to the minus q full rate over the volume of the pond times time times e to the a. Anyway, we know at the beginning, so when the time is equal to zero, the concentration was equal to some c zero. For the time equal to zero, this is e to the power of zero, so this is one. So the concentration is equal to e to the power of a. So e to the power of a has to be equal to c zero. Uh, I'll just write over here. So c is equal to c zero times e to the minus flow rate over volume times the time. That's the concentration in the time t. Anyway, if you all go over there, there is really similarity between the radioactive decay and the decreasing <laughs> of the concentration of the poison inside the pond. That's not just a coincidence. These two processes are really similar and you can find this, this called the exponential decrease. You can find it many, many, many times. Uh, all right, and actually back to the question, which I somehow hit probably. No, uh, the question was, in what time the concentration would be uh, C0 over 10. 
Uh, okay, so we just set this equal to C0 over 10. These two cancels out. And then we take a logarithm of both sides. So here we've got logarithm of one over 10. And here we got logarithm of e to the minus something is that minus something. So that time we need would be, well, logarithm of the fraction is also minus logarithm of the opposite fraction minus is cancels. Oh, this, there should be minus here. Uh, and the time we, we were searching for is Algorithm ten times the value over the four for it. Uh, this result does make a sense because well the higher the fall rate would be the the more fast would be the decrease of the concentration and the larger the pond would be the slower would the decrease be. Oh, okay. Do we have any questions? No. Is anyone watching me? Or I... <laughs> or you don't know? Okay. Uh, what is the next problem I wanted to take a look at? All right. Um, the last problem from the series about mechanics. You probably think that's some hard problem and well, it of course is a hard problem, but it's not, a, not as hard as it may seem on the, on the first side. So, the problem is this, uh, we've got some track, uh, the number of it is um, 17, I think. Uh, the point is we've got some track for the cars and its shape is something like this. So from the top, it looks like like this, but, and from, from the side, it is, um, oh, I said, I don't know, draw very well, something like this. And uh, the cars we let, going down this track don't have any steering so they just um, they just slide on the edge of of the track uh, and we know that this uh, this radius is r and the height difference between this is H and yeah, the point is Yarda uh, let one car down this track and from the one point with zero initial velocity and then another car after some time difference that was five seconds, I suppose. And the question is, what would be the maximal distance between these two cars? Uh, like the 
maximum number of turns, uh, the first car would be ahead from the second car. At first, um, first moment I saw this, I was frightened as well, but I, it really turns out this is not as hard as it seems now, believe me. Okay. Uh, the first thing we would like to know is of course this angle. The, the angle of, of the track actually. Uh, well, if we would take that uh, the track and just do something like this with this, we would get triangle, which this side would be just equal to H and this side would be equal to circumference of uh, of this uh, circle. So just two times pi times r and uh, this angle is right angle. So this side we can calculate as two times pi times r squared plus h squared and square root of that. And this is angle alpha. Um, but we do not actually need alpha. We need sine alpha and cosine alpha. And sine and cosine are just, sine is just ratio of this side over this side. So sine alpha would be equal to h over oh this square root over here. I will just do some shortcuts. And cosine alpha would be two times pi times r over this square root. And uh, so from now on, I will write just sine and cosine alpha. And I would mean these two fractions. Okay, now uh, we can easily calculate um, the acceler acceleration of the car if there would be no friction. The acceleration would be, oh, you get our car, just and there is gravitational force pulling down, but the track is preventing the car from doing directly down. So we have to take a projection of this force to this direction. And as this angle is alpha, this angle is also alpha. So the force that would cause the car to accelerate would be m times g times sine alpha. This Okay. So if there would be no friction and we would for uh, forget that no, oh, no. If there would be no friction, the acceleration of the car, like the the change of uh, value of the speed. I'm not talking uh, acceleration as the changing the direction only. Uh, acceleration as changing the value of speed now. Uh, would be uh, g times sine alpha. At least I hope. And all right, but there is a friction. And the friction is between 
the edge of the track and the car. And the value of friction, we can evaluate as the friction coefficient. In this case, it was stated as mu something like 0 0.4 times the force, uh, the two things are pushing on each other. So in this case, the force, the car is pushing on the wall edge of the track. Uh, so we would use that uh, centripetal force again, as in the problem M3, uh, because, well, that's the force. The, the wall has to push on the car to, for, to for, in order to car car to not go away from the track, just going in the circles down. Uh, so, but we do not have the angular frequency now. We just have some velocities, but that's that, that's not the problem because. Uh, we know that the angular frequency uh, is also equal to the velocity of the thing over its over the ra radius of the circle it is going around. So if you just put that inside here, we get m times the velocity squared over the radius r. Uh, now it is important not to get lost in the not notation because I will just draw the same triangle once again. Let this be our car. If the velocity of the car would um, we if we denote the velocity of the car uh, we then we can take a projection of it to the horizontal uh, no, the ver vertical direction and the horizontal direction, which would be, the values would be just using that sign and cosine, there would be V times sine alpha and V times cosine alpha. All right, and that vertical, uh, vertical projection of the velocity that isn't, it's not circulating around, it's just going down. The, uh, the projection that is circling around is that horizontal projection that it's going like, as, as the car is going around, it's changing around. It's changing a direction in the circle. So actually this is not correct. This is correct because the edge has to only um, cause this projection to change its direction. But then, okay, so the we, we then get our, ourselves our our friction. Uh, well, if we. Well, then the friction would be that mu times m times v squared over r times cosine squared of alpha. Uh, so the actual uh, acceleration of the car would be this minus the friction 
over the mass of the car. So times mu velocity squared over R times cosine squared alpha. Uh, and well, this is once again differential equation, but we will not solve this one. Actually, one of the biggest mistake, mistakes you could have made in this problem was to try to solve this differential equation. It is not unsolvable, but there's actually no need to solve it. Why? Well, let's just take a closer look at this. Uh, at the beginning, the car has zero velocity, so the friction is zero. So uh, the, the acceleration would be positive, so the car would accelerate. Uh, therefore, the velocity would become non-zero, it would be higher and higher, so then the acceleration would be lower and lower. As the acceleration would be lower and lower, uh, the velocity would still increase, but slower and slower. Uh, and well, we can actually calculate uh, the maximum velocity a uh, car could have as, uh, as the velocity uh, for which the acceleration would be zero. Well, we just set this right side equal to zero and to get that the the velocity for which the assertion would be zero, it, that's uh, commonly called the terminal velocity. So V sub T would be equal to uh, G sine of alpha R over mu cosine squared of alpha square root of that. That should be right. And yeah, the car can't get velocity higher than this because if the car would reach this velocity, its acceleration would be zero and it won't accelerate anymore. It would just stay on this, uh, on this velocity. But actually it won't really reach this velocity. It would just get closer and closer to it. We would try to plot some graph of it. Yes. Yes. On this axis, there would be time on this velocity. Let's say here would be velocity the term of velocity at the beginning, the car has zero velocity and it would just rise and it, won't, it should never actually reach that. <laughs> Something like this. There's not to scale, not to anything. I did not really put, solve the equation at the graph, but so it, the graph it will look something like this. Mm. You saw me to draw a battle, so just. <laughs> okay, and now, uh, now it's important to note that uh, the acceleration would be always positive. Well, in order to acceleration to be negative, the velocity of the car uh, would need to be higher than the terminal velocity. In that case, the acceleration would be a negative. But as I just said, the car can't get uh, velocity higher than the terminal one. So the acceleration 
would be always positive. The, uh, the car would only be getting faster and faster. And why is this, is this important? Well, let's get back to the actual question. <laughs> there are two cars, the identical cars from released from the same spot uh, with same zero initial velocity. Just the second one has been released five seconds later. So there equations for the second car would be just the same as for the first car. So the graph, its graph of uh, the velocity would be the same just with that five second delay. So we will just put that in the same plot. It would be something like this. This is that that time difference between releasing the first car and the second car. Uh, now, as I said, the second car is just delayed. So uh, if we would, well, from, we can see it actually from the graph that the velocity of the second car would be always lower for each given time, the velocity of the second car would be lower than the velocity of the first car. That's just because uh, it's, it's five seconds behind it and so it didn't. And yeah, that, that's just because the acceleration is positive. So the, the first car during that five seconds, the first car is ahead, it uh, get higher velocity. Uh, so as the first car is always the faster one, uh, the distance between the first and second car would only increase because, well, the first car is going faster. Uh, but also, we may see from this plot that the difference between their velocities would go to the zero, right? The velocities would be closer and closer to the terminal one and also closer and closer to each other. Um, so hypothetically, at the in, for the infinite time, uh, the both cars would reach terminal velocity. Just the first car would be still the one that is five seconds ahead. So the, the difference uh, between, between them, like I'm, the, the distance between them, and I'm not counting the shortest distance, I'm counting like you know, this distance would be just easily their velocity times uh, that the time the second card is delayed. Uh, do we have any questions about this problem already or? Okay, I'm either too clear or too confusing. But uh, the problem is not asking about this distance between the cars. The problem is asking uh, about the number of turns uh, the first car is ahead of the second one. So once again, <laughs> the same triangle we just have to make projection of uh, that distance to the uh, vertical direction. So 
the, the difference in uh, the, in the height of of the cars would be um, the terminal velocity times the time times sine alpha. And if we want to calculate the number of turns, we have to just divide this difference by um, the difference of the of height difference uh, equivalent to one turn. So that's just H. Uh, th so then we get the number of turns that's between those two cars at, at the hypothetically at the in the infinite time uh, as uh, g times r times sine to the power of three of alpha times t that over mu times h times cosine squared of alpha. And now we would have to plug in uh, those uh, sine and cosine of alpha. But, oh, that would be just algebra. And I think we, we reached the time we should stop. I know we've got a question, okay. In your graph of the function t plus five, as it's in the problem, would translate to the left, t minus five translates to the right. I wanted to ask you if you are showing the second car in the first graph detection. Uh, sorry, can I just see that question? <laughs> I still don't understand. Like, I would try to tell something about the graph of the graphs of uh, the velocities would be the same, just shifted by these five seconds. So, if this is the velocity of the first car, this is the velocity of the second car in just in the time so and we can like set this zero also to if we would say that this is the zero time we could also put the axis here and look that as the second from the uh from the second car's point of view uh just the first car was ahead by something and um, still going faster. Maybe we would take a look at the question uh, with some someone who is better in English. <laughs> or can you, or do you understand the question? Could, could you translate it to me? <laughs> and ask the, and answer that later, I don't know. And well, if that's if there is no other question right now, well, you could you can always send us emails. Our our emails are in the solution book and on the web page, uh, and so on. So we will try to answer them all 
and so I would just like to thank you for your attention and hopefully you learned something and <laughs> goodbye.
So good afternoon and welcome to this session or to the talk. And before I will start, I would like to uh, thank organizers uh, for giving me this chance to present you something about our research, which we are doing at the Institute of Physics of Charles University. And the title of the talk is Magnet Optics and its application in real life. And I added some subtitle from Faraday effect to spin photonics, which is more uh, towards today's and future applications of magnet optical effect. And of course, every scientific results recently is, uh, is uh, get with uh, collaborations with some other people. So I would like to acknowledge our collaborators uh, from MIT because I will show the results which, which were taken in, uh, on their samples. This is mainly from uh, the group of Professor Caroline Ross. Uh, again, some, some of the results were taken in collaborations uh, with uh, Professor Takeuki Ishibashi in, uh, in Nagaoka University of Technology in Japan. Then Professor uh, Leslie Cohen from, from Imperial College in London. And we have also many Czech collaborators, but I, I will mention just two of them right now. And this is Dr. Jan Zeman from Czech Technical University and Dr. Karel, Karel Výborný from Institute of Physics of Czech Academy of Science. So let's jump to the magnet optics. What magnet optics actually is? Because as you can see from the word, it's uh, actually combining optics and magnetism. And simply says, uh, you can say that the, the magnet optical phenomena are optical based on optical response of magnetically altered media. And this can be measured as a change of the polarization state of incident uh, light upon the reflection or transmission through some magnetized medium. And this is due to the different propagation of left and right circular polarized light. And as I mentioned, it covers a vast, vast uh, number of uh, phenomena. And I will today mention only a few of those, but uh, what the polarization is, because the magnet optics is actually uh, based on the polarization change. So as you already, I hope no, uh, light is electromagnetic wave and which means that the vectors of electric and magnetic field are oscillating uh, perpendicular to each other. And actually the polarization is a general property of all kinds of vectorial waves such as uh, this electromagnetic wave. And it means that uh, the uh, the oscillation of these vectors can be uh, can draw, uh, draw some uh, some uh, object in, in space and in general actually uh, the, these vectors the, the ends of these vectors can draw an ellipse this is generally elliptically polarized light and it's it's demonstrated here as well so if you have the polar uh, if you have the propagation or electromagnetic uh, light wave, the, the end of the electric and magnetic field vector is, is, uh, is uh, drawing an ellipse, which can be defined by the azimuth and ellipticity angles. But we have some special cases and these are circle and line shapes or in other words, circular and linearly polarized light. So this, this is uh, shown in sketch here. You can see that in a circular polarized light, the, uh, the vector is a drawing and circle. On the other hand, uh, for, uh, for linearly polarized light, the vectors are uh, oscillating in such kind of, uh, of uh, line as, as is shown in this, in this uh, movie. So uh, there is a way how we can, pro uh, how we can change or transform uh, the polarization of, of uh, the light using some special devices or some special optical elements. And these elements actually can be two, of two types. First type is a polarizer, which is an optical element, which is filtering actually the direction 
for example, the linear polarizer here is filtering the direction of the oscillation of the vectors in uh, in a line. So if you have generally naturally uh, natural light which is uh, not polarized, then the the light is passing through the polarizer, and the polarizer is just filtering uh, and transmitting the uh, the oscillation along the along the direction in which the polarizer is polarizing. This is the same situation here. If you have, for example, 45 uh, degree polarized light, linearly polarized light, and it's going through the polarizer, which has the direction of polarization, polarization of uh, in this uh, direction, then uh, you are you are uh, transmitting just just a part of, of of the of the electric field vector, which is uh, along this direction. And, the, and this is the same situation. You, you, here you have two times. Here you have the polarization along this and the polarization which is coming out of your screen. And then uh, you are transmitting just one time, one uh, one part of the polarization. And here is just a, a simple picture of such kind of polarizer. You also can uh, change the polarization style uh, using phase plates which are special optical elements uh, which are inducing the uh, phase shift between two orthogonal polarization. So what you can do with such kind of polarization elements is that you can transform linearly polarized light, for example, into the circularly polarized light. And this is actually what uh, you can utilize in some uh, kind of optical and magnet optical experiments. So if you will take now two polarizers and they it's not necessary to be the crystalline polarizers like in this picture but you can you can have uh, foil polarizers as well and if you will align their uh, polarization direction parallelly then you can see through them however if you will rotate one polarizer to each other by 90 degree now the first polarizer has the polarization direction in this uh, direction and the second one have uh, the polarization direction perpendicular, then you can't see anything. There is no light transmission through uh, these oriented polarizers because uh, the first polarizer is filtering just the, uh, the oscillation of the light, which is uh, across this direction, but uh, the second polarizer is, is transmitting only this uh, kind of oscillation, which is missing because the first polarizer is filtering only this direction. So uh, you can't see through the uh, through uh, these two polarizers if they are uh, they are uh, set up in this way. And actually, this principle is the elemental principle of. Uh, all polarization based optical measurements, including magnet optical measurements. This is the keystone in the experimental techniques which are used for the, for the measurement of magnet optical effect. So what then is the magnet optical effect? And the first man who observed magnet optical effect was Michael Farad Faraday in 1845. And he observed the polarization rotation of linearly polarized light during the propagation through a rubic glass rod in magnetic field. So here is uh, the well-known sketch. Here you have this this pink uh, uh, this pink part is this uh, rubic glass rod, and it was in a magnetic field uh, which was pointing along the propagation of light. And uh, here is the incident light. So, uh, which was linearly polarized here. You can see the, uh, the, the linear polarization. And due to the far magnet optical effect, the polarization at the output was rotated by some certain angles, uh, angle beta. And actually, uh, Michael Faraday was quite surprised and he wrote some notes in his journals. And what is or what was crucial then and it's still interesting today is that there, there was a sentence, there was an effect pronounced on the polarized rate and thus magnetic force and light 
were proved to have relation to each other. And actually this was one of the first ideas that the light can be electromagnetic wave. So this was, this was just the first, first of these ideas. And I don't know if Michael Faraday was a smoker or not, but in this picture, he is not holding a cigar but he's holding this cubic, uh, this rubic glass rod in which he discovered the effect which was then called by his name. And the history of magnet optics is quite rich and quite long. So from the 1845, uh, which was the first discovery of magnet optical effect afterwards uh, in 1876, Reverend John Carr uh, actually discovered the same effect, but not upon the transmission uh, in magnetized medium, but upon the reflection. And then uh, later on, they have uh, people discovered that you can distinguish between several types of arrangement uh, of, of this effect with respect to the, uh, uh, to the direction of magnetic field. And along the century in uh, 1955, actually, this was also a very interesting discovery that you can use polar polarized light to actually optically uh, change the magnetic order in, in, in some material, which means that using different polarization of light, you can then uh, switch uh, the magnetic alignment in, in the material. In 60s, and I will talk about this a little bit later, they, uh, they, they uh, somehow uh, designed uh, magneto-optical memory uh, devices and Actually, I would mention this, this picture as well, because this was the first experimental de uh, demonstration of spin a hole effect in uh, gallium arsenide wire uh, using magnet optical effect, because here you can see a spin accumulation when you are driving a current through, through this, uh, through this uh, nanowire, then your spins are going to one side with one orientation and to the second side uh, with the uh, opposite orientation. And this could be detected by magnet optical method. So this was uh, the magnet optics is actually very useful experimental technique to study uh, various physical phenomena. So uh, from the microscopic theory, and now I will just show uh, two or three slides with some equations which are not that important, but uh, they are just demonstrating what the magnet optics is. So uh, the optical properties of some magnetized medium which is, uh, which is interacting with, uh, with light wave can be described at optical frequencies only, the response of the medium can be described only by, uh, by simple uh, physical variable permittivity. Uh, maybe uh, who doesn't know what permittivity is, is, is just index of refraction square. Uh, so in a magnetic uh, medium, you can, uh, you can expand uh, this permittivity into the series in terms of magnetization of magnetic order. And if what we are doing and many people are doing, they are just uh, focusing themselves on the linearly uh, a linear term of this expansion and, and uh, are interested in linear magnet optical effects such as uh, Faraday or Kerr effect. So since the, magnet, uh, since the permittivity is magnetization dependent, the magnet optical effects uh, when you are measuring them uh, carries important information about magnetism of, of your, of your uh, interested, uh, of your sample. Then since the magnetic field is, or the magnetization is inducing optical anisotropy in, in the material, uh, this permittivity is not just color, uh, scalar variable as you know from high school, but uh, it has general permittivity uh, or general tensor form, uh, which is quite, uh, quite difficult, let's say, but you can somehow uh, make this uh, a more easier uh, form in, into the more easier form if, if you are using uh, some uh, some symmetry rules. So if what what is uh, why is this permittivity important is 
that when you do spectrally dependent uh, uh, experiments, and I will show this a little bit later, uh, when you are measuring the magnetic optical effect with respect independence on the wavelengths of light which is impacting uh, the material, then you can you can get an um, information about the electronic structure of such material, which is quite uh, important when you are you are uh, designing new types of materials for certain applications. So uh, this permittivity tensor has the uh, diagonal elements which are covering just pure optical optical effects like reflectivity, transmission, and so on. And these off-diagonal terms then describe the magnet optical effect. From the microscopic uh, uh, point of view, uh, the magnet optics originating from the electronic transitions uh, from the states which are Due to, due, to the, due to the magnetic interactions like exchange interactions and then spin orbit coupling. And uh, as you see, these, uh, these arrows have different lengths. And if you will then uh, show the absorption spectrum, which is different for the left and the right circularly polarized light, uh, then you can see uh, the difference. And here, if you want, for example, if you won't have this exchange interactions, this is this is zero, then as you can see, the absorption spectrum for left and right pol circular polarized light is, is, is the same. So uh, the, this, this is not inducing any magnet optical effect. So if you don't have a magnetic material, then you don't have magnet optical effect, as well as if, if you don't have the splitting due to the spin orbit coupling, uh, then these uh, these transitions have also the same uh, energy uh, and at same and occur at same wavelengths of the incident light and then again you don't have any magnet optical activity so both spin orbit coupling and exchange interactions are necessary for magnet optical activity and this is very important for the material design because uh, you can uh, somehow influence the spin orbit coupling using using selective doping of, of the materials for example uh, and as uh, I mentioned, the length of, of these arrows is actually the energy of the light, which is necessary to, uh, to excite the electron uh, from, the, from the ground state to the excited state. So if you then uh, use uh, for in your measurements, uh, the wavelength dependence of the, of the magnet optical effect, which means you do some spectroscopic measurements, you can then uh, get the in, in, uh, important information about the electronic structure because you will then get an information about the energetic uh, uh, separation of, of the of the excited and ground states and indeed this is what people are doing when they, they are doing magnet optical research and uh, you can you can then find that for any electronic transition you, you can you can have uh, an absorption and dispersion of of the permittivity and actually you are not measuring the permittivity directly but you are measuring a ratio of the reflection of of the s polarized wave of the s polarized wave and uh, the ratio of the s polarized incident wave and p polarized out, out, uh, outgoing wave so uh, usually the magnet optical rotations are quite small, especially when you are measure, when you are interested in some kinds of various nanostructures. So how we can measure very tiny uh, angles of polarization rotation, and there are plenty of uh, techniques how to do that. But I will mention here just one which we developed in in our laboratory, and this is the rotating analyzer setup. So we are using a white light source, which, uh, which, uh, in which the beam then is going through the first polarizer and is polarized in, in, in this way. Then uh, it's reflecting on the sample and going through the pol second polarizer called analyzer, which is actually crossed with the, with the first polarizer. And now if we apply magnetic field, this incident polarization is rotated. So the polar, two polarizers are not now uh, crossed uh, 
generally crossed because there is uh, the, these two polariz uh, polarization directions are not crossed at all. So now we can detect some intensity be be because before we couldn't detect anything on the on our CCD spectrometer. So what we are doing now next is we are rotating with this analyzer a taking the intensity of the light uh, on the on the spectrometer for any wavelengths uh, of the light which is impacting the material and this dependence can be then uh, uh, displayed as it is in, in this graph. And if you will do some calculations, then the, uh, the intensity of the, on the detector depends on, on the rotation of the, of, of the analyzer, but also depends on the care, uh, care effect or care uh, magnet optical rotation and also electricity. So uh, when we, after the measurement of the data, we fit uh, these points by, by, by this uh, uh, theoretical dependence and we can then distinguish uh, what is the exact angle of, of the magnet optical rotation. So this allows us fast and accurate uh, measurement because uh, we are able to sense the rotation below one milli-degree which is very, very tiny, uh, very small angle. And we can do the spectroscopic measurements because here we are using CCD spectrometer. And it can be also uh, generally applied for uh, quadratic magnet optic measurements as well. But what we can do uh, uh, more is that we can modify such kind of setup to, to do the spatially resolved uh, measurements using the standard microscope. So now we have the microscopic setup, uh, we have the light source, and again, we are uh, rotating with the analyzer and taking the picture of, of the sample for any, every rotation and then make this fitting. So then we can observe actually the domain structures of different magnetic materials. The domain structures are uh, the structures when the magnetic uh, magnetization or magnetic uh, alignment is different in different parts of, of, the, of the sample. So then you can even make some uh, some movies when you are applying the magnetic field you are changing the uh, align magnetic alignment in, in the sample so then you can you can have accurate values of, of your uh, magnet optical rotation for each pixel in the in the picture so uh, so far, I was I was mentioning the magnet optical effects and how we can measure them. So magnet optics itself is a uh, very effective uh, research uh, research uh, tool. It's very effective probe of magnetic properties of the material. So if if you do something we call magnetometry, which means you focus your light only uh, only at one wavelength, uh, which uh, this means you can use uh, some laser, for example, with on particular wavelengths, and then you are changing the magnetic field which is applied to, to some magnetic material. And since uh, the uh, magnet optical rotation, magnet optical effect is uh, uh, linearly dependent on the magnetic order, then you can you can do the hysteri you can observe the hysteresis loops of, uh, of various materials to get the information about the magnetic properties. Here you can do also the uh, uh, you can rotate with your sample and, and get the information about magnetic anisotropies on the sample and, and so on. So this is the one approach what you can do. The second one is uh, the spectroscopic measurement. Uh, this gives you this will give you the information about the electronic structure because as I showed uh, already uh, the the microscopic origin of magnet optical effects uh, is based on the quantum nature uh, of, uh, of the matter. So uh, you, you apply constant magnetic field uh, to, the, to the investigative material. The best way is to use the magnetic field as high as possible to magnetically saturate the, the material. And then you are changing the wavelengths or the energy 
uh, of the uh, incident light and measure the rotation. So then you can you can get the spectrally dependent magnetoptical effect, and with uh, with the help of some calculations, you can then derive the, uh, the part of the permittivity tensor, which is directly related. And there are many theories how to do that. Uh, directly related to the electronic transition in the in the material. So then you can describe or try to describe the electronic structure of, of the investigated material with respect to the band structure and so on. Or what you can also do is to, and this is some special case, but you can also measure the spectroscopy, the spectral dependence of the magnetoptical effect, and then try uh, to do some, some um, macroscopic modeling uh, of, for example, some uh, special multi-layers. And from this, you can get the information about the interfaces between, for example, two magnetic layers or two, uh, one magnetic layer, one non-magnetic layer, uh, because uh, when we are talking about the layers which are several nanometers or tens of nanometers thin, then the interface between these layers can uh, crucially influence the overall um, magnetic properties of, of the structure. So this is again some, some approach how you can actually, uh, how you can uh, apply the magnet optical uh, or magnet optic experiments as a probe tool. So this was just like general introduction uh, to the magnet optical uh, effects and, and techniques. And now I would like to show you some of current research on the potential magnet optical applications, which can probably lead to something we, we try to call spin photonics. And this I will show you at the end of this presentation. So uh, first of all, I would, uh, make a step aside and mention one applic magnet optical application, which was somehow already discontinued, but it was magnet optical recording, which was developed uh, by Sony company and adopted by Canon and X companies. And uh, in this recording, these were just these tiny mini disc uh, diskettes. And uh, the, the recording was done based on the magnetic material. So you uh, inside or on the disk, you, you had the par parts where, where the magnetic order was uh, pointing upwards and parts where the magnetic order was pointing downwards. And this was your one or your zero. So <clears throat> you were then using a laser which, which was polarized and and reflected from, from this kind of medium. And due to the uh, polarization change, polarization rotation, uh, uh, because of, of this magnetic alignment, then uh, you should sense uh, some intensity on the detector or you can't sense, depending whether you are reflecting from, from the part which is zero or which is one. And here is, here is some uh, domain or some, some picture when you can see the black uh, dots are the uh, one domains and the remaining is, is zero domain. So uh, this was quite interesting technology and actually it, it allowed to go up to nine gigabytes uh, for 5.25 inch diskette in uh, 2008. So it wasn't that bad, but uh, the rapid development in, in the SSD and hard drive uh, technology uh, quite uh, killed this, this, uh, this recording. So one of the interesting applications of magneto optics is magnet optical detection of malaria. And actually malaria is a very bad disease. It's uh, impacting the, uh, it's impacting the human body. And actually it is impacting the red, red blood cells. And these cells, it, the malaria is eating uh, these cells, but uh, it's, it, the malaria likes just a part of, of, of the blood cell. And the second part, which it, it is leaving in your blood is actually 
poisons for for her. So uh, the Malaya is creating something which is called hemozoin crystals. Uh, this is this is the remaining of of your blood cells, and actually the, these crystals are uh, paramagnetic. So if as, as here is shown, if you will put these crystals into the magnetic field, they will align across the magnetic field. And if they are aligned, then if you will shine a laser light through them, then they will change the polarization of, of, of the impacting laser, laser uh, radiation. So this is actually, this is actually, oh, sorry. Uh, this is actually, what it is happening in the real time measurement uh, that uh, as you can see here, this is the differential intensity, which uh, with respect to the amount of the concentration of the hemozoin crystals in your blood. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see, it's linearly dependent. So as, uh, as higher amount of hemozoin crystals you have, the higher is change in the polarization light. So, then this can be done in vivo measurement. So it's not necessary to take your blood out. You will just put your finger into the magnet and in the, uh, your finger will be irradiated by, by laser light. And they have, uh, the people have high success rate of the distinguishing whether you have or whether you don't have malaria. So this is very in interesting application of magnet optical effect in, in real, real world. And another application can be in magneto-optical imaging systems. And for that, you need some special material which will uh, act as a magneto-optical indicator. And what you want to do is to sense a magnetic field. So uh, this is actually uh, how this, this is the sketch, how it is looks like. You have some sample which has, uh, which has the magnetic field, and then you put the magnet optical sensor, which is special magnet optical material with high magnet optical effect rotation. And as you can see, this sample will align the magnetization in the sensor along the field. So, it, the samples is inducing the spatial distribution of magnetization, uh, non-homogeneous spatial distribution of magnetization in the sensor. Then if you will uh, illuminate such kind of sensor with polarized light as, as it is here shown, then upon the reflection, the polarization is changing with respect to the place on, on the, on the uh, sensor. You can see that here when the, polar, uh, when the magnetization is pointing downwards, then the rotation is uh, on one, uh, one direction and when pointing upwards is in second direction. And then when you will uh, put the second polarizer or analyzer called analyzer uh, uh, in the way of the reflected light, then you can rotate this analyzer to be crossed with one type of the, this polariza polarization. So it's blocking then one reflection and it's transmitting only the second reflection. So the light which is reflected from the uh, magnetization point and upwards, it's, it's uh, actually uh, blocked and only the uh, light which is reflected from the magnetization going downwards is transmitted. So in this way, you can create a contrast and you can display non-homogeneous distribution of magnetic field across uh, your point of interest. And this is actually what, what uh, the, these sensors are uh, main, meant for. And this is uh, mainly the safety devices, for example, in cash, uh, cash machines. And this is what our Japanese colleagues were in, very interested in. So uh, actually today you can find on YouTube uh, many, many manuals how to copy, for example, a credit card. And here you can see the magneto optical image of card stripes uh, using this, this kind of, of sensor. And actually the, uh, here is a cross section of this, uh, this kind of sensor as well. So then uh, 
you what what people want to do is to implement such kind of devices into the cash machines for instant analysis and this is actually not applicable to only to the bank cards but you can apply this also for for uh, bills because uh, the, these bills actually uh, are printing using magnetic ink so then you can display actually uh, the stray field the magnetic field from from this ink using magnetic optical method so uh, this is very uh, very uh, actually interesting topic and uh, Japanese companies want to uh, to develop some device which can be implemented within these cash machines and for this you need transparent materials with high magnet optical rotation to to get very nice magnet optical contrast and of large sizes because the bank bills or or, or the cars are not that small so how to do that and for this the people were using and still are using uh, a family of materials, uh, which is uh, actually uh, magnetic or ferry magnetic garnets. And uh, garnets themselves are one of the most complicated materials in, in nature uh, because they, they have uh, many, many atoms in, in actually unit cell and the unit cell is quite large. It's more than 1.2 nanometers actually. This is a huge cell and you, as you can see, uh, the, the magnetic moment is usually coming fro from the iron which is inside this very magnetic garnet. And uh, they, are, they also have uh, included bismuth into these structures because bismuth is quite heavy element and in, it is inducing large spin orbit interaction in, in the material. So it's enhancing actually the magnet optical effect. And in these materials, the magnet optical effect is driven by electron transition between uh, transitions between oxygen to uh, some balanced states of oxygen and I don't want I don't want to go into the details but also from oxygen to the iron iron ions so there is some charge transfer from the oxygen to iron and uh, since uh, or due to this electronic transitions the magnet optical effect the spectral dependence is looking like this and these red arrows are actually indicating these electronic transitions uh, from from the oxygen to 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 iron ions so when you are looking uh, at, the, at the composition you can see that if you will in input more bismuth inside this garment then you increase the spin orbit interaction and and as you can see you enhancing the magnet optic effect which is uh, the case you want because you want high as high as possible the magnet optical response uh, to have large rotation if you have large rotation you have better contrast to your imaging device yeah okay so, and there are also many techniques how to prepare uh, the magnet optical or the ferrimagnetic garnets using, using magnetron sputtering or pulse laser deposition. But these, these methods are not uh, that useful for, for the industrial uh, uh, applications. These are more to the research side. So our uh, colleagues in Japan, they have developed uh, the method based on metal organic decomposition where you are just putting some metal organics or on the substrate then spinning the substrate to get the equal distribution of the metal organics uh, across the, the substrate and then they are actually heating up the substrate they are annealing the substrate and ob obtaining uh, obtaining the thin magnet optically active layer and this is very effective low cost and large scale technique because they, they have told me they are limited just by the spin coater itself. Uh, 
one disadvantage is they, that they uh, this this actually is very slow growth. So if you want like very thick layers, uh, you you can't use this technique because you would have to do this spin coating like 100 times. But they are aiming for several tens or 100 nanometers only. So this is this is uh, this is applicable here, and actually some. Uh, papers of very, uh, very well-known, actually, prestige uh, physical journals are, uh, you were based on, on, the, on these techniques, actually. So here are then some pictures. You can see that you can, uh, you can deposit or you can grow the magnetoptically active layers on large uh, large uh, substrate, and here you you can see actually the magneto optical imaging using this uh, this garnet, oh, and uh, you can see the magnetic field, the distribution of the magnetic field uh, in the vicinity of permanent magnets, neodymium permanent magnets, or these these uh, uh, spheres as well, or you can even display the magnetic field which is coming from some electronic devices uh, such as uh, cell phone which is here you can see here some some chips like bluetooth chip and wi-fi chip here uh, using the, this kind of this kind of uh, material so <clears throat> actually these uh, these materials can uh, provide high magnet optical contrast and uh, they have just 200 nanometers they are just 200 nanometers thick, and they can even uh, be responsible to uh, to AC uh, magnetic field up to two gigahertz, or they are aiming for five gigahertz. It doesn't matter right now, but but uh, the purpose is to display some stray magnetic field from from different sources like uh, like uh, electronic devices or these bales and bank cards to have some security measurements. So this was one of the applications when you can use the magnet optical effect. Another application is uh, in the display industry. And as you probably know, there is rapid development and risk, uh, there are like huge requested uh, from the display industry because people want uh, more and more detailed uh, image in their TV. So uh, today the HD TV is quite like standard. Maybe it's going uh, out and it, it's replacing by 4K TV. And if you will look at these uh, numbers, you can see that if you have HD TV 127 uh, diagonal, then uh, the pixel pitch, which is the uh, which is the distance of, from each pixel, is something like 576 micrometers. And if you have 4K TV, you are going down to, of course, like you will go to half, so to an 88. And if you want to do the 8K TV, which which the Japanese guys were aiming for, then they, you have 144 micrometers in pixel pitch. Then if you were focused on some cell phones, which have much smaller diagonal of, of the display, then this pixel pitch is going down and down. So today the people are now developing the devices uh, for, for 8K, uh, 8K displays, or they are uh, developing uh, the technology which will be able to display uh, 8Ks. Uh, th there are already some of these uh, TVs are in the market already, but we should be careful about that as well because then one full movie will take your uh, take like four terabytes of your data. So uh, this is coming with with the disadvantage, or uh, the people are also developing some techniques how to store fast and accurately store a, a huge amount of data. So what are the requirements? Uh, I just listed a few of them, but I would point out the high contrast, fast pixel switching, which means you want a high, as high as possible the refresh rate for, for your TV or for your games. Uh, you want high pixel density, which means as much detail, uh, detailed picture as you, can get, which means small pixel pitch. 
And of course, you, you need low energy consumption because uh, this is the big topic right now. Uh, and uh, of, you can also want uh, the 3D imaging. And that's where the magnetoptics coming into the play because current 3D display technology uh, is uh, depending on the special glasses, which uh, which are based on the polarization transmission for left and right uh, or right eye, and this is this, they have disadvantages like narrow view, viewing angles or crosstalks. So this is something like back to user experience usually, and. So the researchers now are coming to, to some spatial light modulators, which could actually uh, provide a holographic, uh, holographic picture, 3D holographic picture. And these spatial light modulators can be based on different techniques, but one of them is magneto-optical. So um, you will just provide, you will, you will actually simulate the uh, holographic interference fringes and you will, uh, what people want to do is to switch them electronically to change these fringes to generate a uh, moving holographic, uh, holographic uh, picture. Here, here is an example. If you have uh, uh, calculated holographic, uh, uh, holographic recording, and then you will uh, illuminate, illuminate such kind of uh, structure by laser light, you, you will get these, these uh, watches, for example. And the magneto-optical spatial light modulator is actually working on the same principle as the magneto-optical indicator. So you also have a, an array of pixels which are illuminated by uh, linearly polarized light. And after the reflection based on each pixel, the, uh, the polarization is rotating on one or second side, depending if uh, if the pixel, if the magnetic first magnetic layer of the pixel is pointing upwards, of the magnetization is pointing upwards or downwards, and uh, then there is a second polarizer which is blocking one polarization and is transmitting the second one. So then, if you have this kind of uh, of image, then you can display this image uh, using this kind of display. And you can, there are plenty of ways like uh, how to switch this uh, free magnetic layer of the pixel, for example, using some spin polarized current, or you can use, for example, some uh, piezoelectrically induced strain. But here is a comparison of, uh, of the pixel size, time response, and modulation method. Uh, so as you can see, uh, if, you can do such kind of thing and you can also generate the holographic display using just LCD liquid crystal display. But you are limited to the pixel size of five micrometers, which is quite big and is actually limiting your uh, viewing angle because uh, when you want large viewing angles, you need smaller pixels, you, meet, you need much detailed these interference fringes. Uh, the, time, uh, re the response time is also quite large comparing this uh, magnet-optical modulators. Uh, so the, this magnet-optical spatial light modulator uh, seems to be like promising method how to do that. And actually the, the, our colleagues in Japan just demonstrated that it's, it's possible and they are preparing uh, preparing such kind of displays for, for the future development. Actually, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting, but not that easy. So one of the material you can use for this free magnetic layer can be, for example, gadolinium iron, which is the, uh, which is the material uh, which has uh, two ions, iron and gadolinium, both, both have a magnetic moment, but pointing in opposite way. And by changing uh, the ratio of gadolinium and iron in this alloy, you can change the compensation temperature, which means the temperature when these two arrows of my, or, the, or the values of magnetic moments are the same. So uh, then if you will, uh, cross the compensation temperature 
uh, you switch your uh, sign of the magnet's optical effect as, as it's uh, demonstrated here. Here you have one composition and here is have second composition and you can see that the spectral dependence is almost same, but the sign of the rotation is different because for one uh, composition, the, the iron moment is higher than the gadolinium, but for the second one, the gadolinium moment is higher than the iron, so the, the net magnetic moment is pointing once upwards and once downwards. So uh, this is actually a very interesting topic and you can design special kind of materials to, for, for this purpose. And as I mentioned, another way is to apply some strain to the magnetic layer uh, to actually switch uh, the magnetization, the magnetic moment, and then switch the sign of the curve rotation. And this can be something very new, something very of very new family of materials. And these are non-collinear antiferromagnetic materials. And uh, these are very complicated materials, but the magnetic moment of manganese, you can see these arrows here, uh, is actually not uh, parallel or anti-parallel to each other, but it's forming something like a uh, like, uh, star. And uh, this is very important from the application point of view, because if you will then uh, deposit a layer of such material on a piezomagnetic material, which by applied voltage will stress or uh, somehow induce strain in this, uh, in this uh, magnetic material, then you can rotate with these magnetic moments upwards uh, or in different direction, which will result in the opposite net magnetic moment of this layer, which will result in opposite care uh, sign of care rotation. So uh, this, is, uh, this is also uh, the way how you can build a display uh, with different uh, pixels, which will be uh, working on, on such kind of switching. So this was like these applications based on some uh, display technology, some, some imaging. And there is one more application I would like to mention. And this is, uh, this is uh, related to the uh, current problems of classical integrated electronics. And pe many people are saying that this will be future apocalypse. I don't think so. But a uh, few years ago, 2016, the people have found that the Moore, Moore's law is not valid anymore, which means that the number of transistors is not doubling about every two years because these people can't shrink the transistors to the infinitely small size. Why is that? Because as you can see here, if you have uh, the actually the uh, the technology of the tr the transistor technology, which is now called five nanometers, ten nanometers, three nanometers technology, uh, is uh, based on the size of the channel on the gate, and this channel is actually the crucial part of the of the transistor because it's it's the gate is open the, the current can go through or the, when the gate is closed there is a depletion region there are no electrons so the current can't go through through the through the gate uh, but uh, the channel is too narrow here that the electrons now can follow the quantum laws on physics and can tunnel through through the uh, through the gate, even if it is closed, then you are losing uh, the ability of your transistor. So the the thing is how to overcome this, and there are again new. There are many fields of physics which are researching what will be the possible way, and one of this is called spin electronics, which should use. Uh, as a as a carrier of the information, not the electron itself, but the spin of the electron, then you will get rid of these uh, types of problems. Uh, 
there are also some other problems of classical electronics, and this is uh, these are some prediction of the data growth. So as you can see, and this is up just up to 2017, but you can extrapolate this and you will see that the number of data or the amount of data uh, uh, is rapidly increasing and people are generating huge amount of the data every year. It's it's crazy. It's like crazy. You are using social media. You are you you are watching TV in high definition. So you you have a lot, tons of data, and as you can see from this bottom uh, figure, uh, the data growth is it's quite quite large. So you will create the data, but you need to handle this data. So what do you need? You need uh, high density data storage to store your data somewhere. Otherwise you will lose them within a few months. Uh, and these, of course, these uh, uh, data storage devices should not be that expensive. Otherwise you won't be able to, to buy them. Uh, so this is the storage part of, of this problem. And the second thing is that you need high speed data transfer. You you have to you have to transfer the data. For example, this this uh, talk is transferred via internet, and you can stream it on YouTube. Uh, but you need high speed transfer, and you need high speed transfer within long distances, which is actually the field of fiber optics, and it's quite well established. And the the transfer speeds are quite high today. But you would also benefit if you could transfer your data with a high speed on the computer chip, not only to the large distances, but very small distances uh, within one computer chip. And this is the second problem because, uh, and I will start from the bottom of this slide, because as you can see here, the, the large distance communication is now governed by optical, optical signals and they, they actually allow to transfer thousands of gigabit of data per second. While on the intrachip distances, which means uh, from half to 10 millimeters, they are still based on electrical wiring. And this electrical wiring is limited to something like 10 gigabit per second. So even if your CPU is very fast, even if your memory is very fast, they are communicating via uh, electric wires, which do not, uh, do not transfer in such high speeds as, as optical fibers. So this is, this is something what people are recently want to change. And the second thing is the energy consumption. And here, here, here are some predictions what will happen because uh, actually uh, this is the energy consumption increase every year of all computer system in the world. And as you can see, as the number of computers in the world is increasing, the energy consumption is increasing. But the second thing is that the world's energy production is not increasing that fast, or maybe not at all. So uh, there would be a problem that uh, you will need high, much higher energy to, to drive your, your computers and your, uh, your electronics than the world can produce. So uh, this is the second thing what people are now trying to avoid. And there are the many researchers are now researching uh, the devices which, has, which have a low uh, energy consumption. And here are just a few comparison. If you have your hard drive, then to write one bit of the data will uh, cost you from 10 to 100 nanojoule of energy. If you will use your flash memory, then it's uh, 10 nanojoule, actually is the bottom limit. If you will use some special uh, random access memory uh, based on spin transfer talk. So this is the magnetic memory, which was developed uh, recently and it's now produced by Samsung, for example, you will need just 450 picojoule. So you are going down with, the, with your energy consumptions. And if you will use uh, some device which will uh, write your, uh, your one bit of information using optical, uh, optical uh, a 
approach, then you need just 10 femtojoule. And I will show you in the, uh, after some few slides, uh, even uh, lower energy consumption. So let's now a little bit talk about this uh, data transfer. And here are now first attempts uh, to overcome the limit of, uh, of electrical wiring. So in this paper, uh, scientific paper recently in 2000, I don't know, 16, 18, there was a single chip microprocessor that communicates directly using light. And actually uh, here is a sketch and here was, uh, it was based on the, on the laser which, uh, which then uh, was as a light source for the communication. But in this case, there was no magnetic isolation device which would prevent the back reflections coming from the imperfections of the waveguides because you do these waveguides by lithography, even though uh, from this picture, they seems like quite ideal. The, the sidewalls are not, uh, not actually flat, so there are some back reflections which are coming back to the laser and uh, the laser is a little bit destabilized that you are, then you are losing your signal. There is a high uh, signal to noise, uh, noise to signal ratio and, and uh, you have some, uh, you have like bad communication. So this would be great if we would have some, something like integrated magnet optical isolation device or let's call it optical one way. Uh, so this is actually what people uh, are doing in the field of magnet optics, because so far you can uh, commercially buy bulky magnet optical isolator or magnet optical one way if you want. And it's, it's used in laser physics to prevent the, opti uh, the, the back reflections from uh, the optical elements come to the, to the laser and destabilize it. So how it is working, it's quite, quite easy. Uh, or quite simple, simple technique. You have your incident light, which is going from the laser, which is here. And first it's polarized uh, along this, uh, let's call it uh, vertical direction. This uh, polarized light is then going through the Faraday crystal, which is in magnetic field. So this uh, vertical polarization is rotated by angle of 45 degree, 45 degree. And then here is the second polarizer, which transfer, uh, transfers or uh, transmits the light in 45 degrees. So all the light is going through. When there is a back reflection from, for example, lens, which is situated somewhere here, then the reflected light is now polarized in 45 degree. It's going through the Faraday crystal, but now the thing is changing because the, uh, the magnetic field is now pointing, uh, pointing on uh, the other way uh, as a, in forward direction. So the, the polarization is not compensated. The rotation is not compensated to, to vertical direction, but is rotating 45 degree more. So now it has 90 degree polarization, the light here. Now, and since, since the, uh, pol this polarizer transmits only for vertical polarization, and this is horizontal polarization, and there is no power which is vertical, then the whole, uh, whole light is blocked and nothing is going to the laser. And for these applications, again, ferromagnetic garnets with high Faraday rotation are used usually. So now the problem is how to shrink this bulky big device, which is working fine into the integrated optical chip. And you can't use this, uh, this polarizer, uh, polarizer's method. You, you have to use something else, which is called non-reciprocal uh, phase shift. And it covers a waveguide through which the light is going and a resonant ring, and here the, the yellow color, color is the magnet optically active material in, mag in magnetic field. So uh, when you are going, uh, when the light is going into, in the forward direction and is, for example, right circularly polarized, for certain wavelengths, uh, there is a resonance in, uh, which results in the in the fall of transmission because the light is resonantly, uh, uh, resonantly shifted to this resonant ring and say here. So here is the, here is the resonance and this is the transmission of uh, independence of wavelengths. 
On the other hand, when you are going when you are going backwards, this situation occurs again. But now you don't have right circularly polarized light; you have left circularly polarized light. And since the Faraday rotation, as we already mentioned at the beginning, means that you have different refractive index that feels right and that feels left circularly polarized light. This uh, uh, this um, transmission or uh, this resonance for the backwards propagating light occurs at different wavelengths because the light feels different uh, refractive index. And if you will tune uh, this geometry because the resonance also depends on the geometry of, of, of the, the size of the ring and so on. So if you are using the telecommunication wavelengths, which is 1550 1, nanometers and tuned these dimensions that for the forward uh, propagating light, you have very low loss of the transmission and for backward propagating light, you have High, uh, high losses or low transmission. So on, only the thing you need is to prepare some magnets optically active material on, on, the, on the substrate, on the silicon substrate. And this is actually the key point and the biggest problem of current magnet optical materials because we talk here about uh, ferrimagnetic garnets which have very large mag uh, unit cell, uh, more than 100 atoms are in, uh, in the unit cell. And then you, are, you want to deposit or prepare thin film of such kind of material on very small unit cell of silicon. So it will result actually in amorphous layer, not crystalline layer, which has almost no magnet optical activity and very high uh, high absorption by, by itself, so it, you can't use it actually for 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 these uh, integrated magnet optic devices. So people are now looking what to do in this situation, and there is a high demand for new silicon compatible uh, materials which are not based on garnets, but also uh, silicon compatible composition of ferrimagnetic garnets because. Our friends in MIT, they have found some uh, special treatment and they can now prepare this kind of garnets uh, on silicon substrate. And these are, for example, cerium or bismuth doped yttrium iron garnets. Actually, uh, when you look at the magnet spectral dependence of the magnet optical effect, you can see that one uh, that in the infrared part, low energy region, actually one uh, 1550 nanometers is 0 0.8 electron volt. Here, you can increase the magnet optical activity using uh, cerium doping because uh, the cerium have some crystal free transitions uh, which will enhance the magnet optical acti uh, activity in infrared region. And you can actually, uh, uh, you can achieve very high figure of magnet optical figure of merit, which is a ratio of the Faraday rotation. This is what you want as high as possible and optical absorption, this is what you want as low as possible. So then you can, you can prepare thin films which have almost the same, uh, same uh, figure of merit as bulk, bulk crystals, which are the most perfect structures uh, made from these materials. And this is just a slide which was maybe interesting only for me. But uh, when you cool down the, the layer of such kind of material, you are, <coughs> you are inducing uh, temperature, uh, temp uh, you are inducing the strain in the layer due to the different uh, uh, expansion, coef uh, expansion coefficients of the substrate and of the sample of, of, this, of this layer because of the temperature dependence. And then you can change the magnetic properties uh, of, of such kind of material with temperature. So this is not that important. So as I said, to deposit this, uh, the ferrimagnetic or any kind of magneto-optical active uh, material on silicon, uh, silicon substrate for, for the application in uh, integrated magneto-optic isolator is very hard. So how to do that? 
you you can do more ways and i just uh, here picked one of these which we were interested in recently and this is the deposition of bismuth substituted uh, yttrium iron garnet because the as i uh, as i showed and as i told you the bismuth is actually increasing the magnetoeptic effect when you see these pictures you can see that with higher amount of bismuth in yttrium iron garnet you have higher Faraday rotation because you are in, uh, increasing the spin orbit coupling. And uh, you can deposit this kind of material on the, uh, on the silicon substrate using some uh, seat layer. They call it seat layer, which is just yttrium iron garnet. So if you will use pulse, pulse laser deposition, when you will uh, you will illuminate the target of, of, the, of this material, which is depositing uh, by a high power laser pulse, then you can, you, can, uh, you can then deposit the layer. And after depositions of these two layer, you, uh, you rapidly increase the temperature to several hundreds of degrees, and uh, which will end up in the recrystallization of such kind of flares because, because before this rapid thermal annealing, they would be amorphous, but if you will heat them up, uh, this, uh, why, uh, this yeek layer is actually uh, functioning as a seat layer and, uh, and the whole structure is recrystallizing and you can, you can obtain a polycrystalline layer with very nice Faraday rotation. Uh, in the at the telecommunication wavelengths, so this is very very interesting. And actually, you can also at, uh, you can also have very low optical absorption of such kind of layers because uh, of the higher quality using this recrystallization. So you can prepare this, and you can uh, you can have quite high figure of merit of such kind of of materials. And so this is actually what you can use for the integrated optical circuits. And this is just uh, a cross-section from uh, electron microscope uh, scanning and tunnel, uh, transmission electron microscopes. And here you can see uh, the whole structure. Uh, here you have the waveguide, here you have the uh, SIO2 uh, cladding layer, and here is the actually the garnet layer. So you can prepare by this recrystallization method you can you can prepare quite high quality material which can actually also grow be grown on the side walls of the of the waveguide here which is also important because if if you will do that then you can you can do the uh, isolation uh, not only for one uh, polarization of light which is going through the waveguide but also for the second one, tra uh, tra uh, ah, sorry, T transverse magnetic and tra transverse electric uh, polarization. So these were like the, uh, the ferrimagnetic garnets and just few examples, two examples of other more uh, exotic materials, uh, which is cerium oxide, which is doped by hafnium and cobalt. And uh, based on the amount of the hafnium inside, inside the cerium oxide, you can actually change the electronic structure, which is here calculated by first principles calculations. And you can then tune the optical absorption. You can see that you can bring the optical absorption towards lower energy region, or you can shift it to, towards a higher energy region. So it depends on the wavelengths you want to uh, use uh, for which you want to use this isolation device. And also the Faraday rotation quite depends uh, on the amount of the, of the half neon inside, inside this material. And the, here are just pictures from the uh, transition, uh, tra um, transmission electron microscope and uh, some elemental analysis. You can see that these all elements are evenly spread it across the layer. So they are, these are not the cobalt, actually the cobalt is not clustering, not uh, creating nanoparticles, which would be bad for, for this. So, so you can tune the materials for the certain applications uh, of the magnetoptical effect, which, which is this demonstration. And there were 
other material, which is quite complicated, is some perovskite structure, strontium gallium, cobalt oxide, and there were cobalt nanoparticles in it, as, as you can see here from transmission electron microscope. The cobalt is now here in the elemental analysis clustering. And uh, the cobalt clusters are actually enhancing uh, the magnet optical activity, which is, which is very good actually for the application. The bad thing is that since you have metallic cobalt in, in the material, the optical absorption is actually increasing. And when it's increasing, you can't use it for the trans transmission type of devices because you will lose the signal. The light will be absorbed in, in, this, in this kind of device. So this is not so convenient for uh, magnet optical isolation devices. So, and at the end, I would like to uh, show or share some thoughts on uh, what, what will be the future of magnet optical applications. Uh, still, it will be advanced experimental tool which people are using, but uh, what people are trying and we are trying as well is to combine the spintronic or spin electronics concepts uh, together with photonic concepts and sometimes even uh, plasmonic concepts to create something we call spin photonics. And uh, which means which means that you might be able to create a device when uh, you will switch the magnetization of the material by light and uh, the material will control the polarization of the light. So it can be the way to do something like all optical transistor. And I, I, I will show some pictures a little bit later. So uh, the spintronics approaches. So what we need for this is to control, the precisely control the magnetic alignment in some kind of materials. And there are tons of ways how to do that. Uh, people who are researching or who are doing research in spintronics, they, they have found uh, a lot of uh, ways how to do that, but the most uh, current uh, and maybe the most effective is something they call spin orbit talk, which means that uh, if you have uh, some, and here it is a uh, ferrimagnetic theorem iron garnet, and you have a structure which uh, in in which you are flowing a current due to the current uh, due to the spin hole effect the the spin uh, the electron will spin on uh, pointing one uh, one direction are going to the one side of the of the wire and the uh, electrons with the spin of, of in opposite direction are going to the opposite side and uh, these spins actually on the side are influencing the magnetization or the magnetic order in, in this ferrimagnetic uh, material. So you can switch or you can change uh, the magnetization of the material using electrical current, which is, which is very, very promising. And actually the theorem iron garnet is magnet optically active and is ferrimagnetic insulator and is transparent. So it's also good for some optical uh, or these magnet optical special light modulators. Other types as barium, uh, some barium hexafarides. Uh, but, and this is one way how you can electrically co uh, control the carry rotation in, in some device like these pixels of holographic displays. And we, we have researched some types of, of these garnets. It's actually not a thurium, but terbium iron garnet, which has actually even the compensation point. So when you are heating up or cooling down the, uh, the sample, the, uh, the, the garnet, then you can switch the sign of the carry rotation and you can control the, uh, this uh, by, by temperature, for example. And this is actually one of the last slides. And here, the people recently demonstrated something which is very interesting. And this is uh, the way how to control them or how to, how to switch the magnetic order in a ferrimagnetic garnet using very fast femtosecond laser pulses. And uh, here is then the evolution of the magnetization within, uh, within uh, the time. This is dynamics of magnetic order. 
and here, here is the magnet optical microscope picture. So you can see here that if you impact the, uh, uh, the garnet using polarized light in one direction, you can create a part of the material when, where the magnetic alignment is pointing along, for example, upwards. And then when you will use the incident light with uh, with uh, other polarization, uh, then you will erase it. So this is very fast laser induced writing of the information to, to some magnetic material. And it's fast ever rewrite even because they claim actually in this paper that uh, they can achieve this write read within 20 picoseconds. So it's 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 quite quite fast. It's uh, orders of magnitude faster than than the hard drive or uh, or flash memory. And also claim that uh, it's it, gen it generates low low heat. Actually, it needs quite uh, very or quite small amount of energy to write it. Um, because if you will recalculate uh, this uh, this energy consumption with respect to the one bit which is used in the hard drive, which is 2020 times 10 nanometers, cubic nanometers, then you need just 22 attojoule of the energy, which is uh, crazy. It's very small, but it's some like cheating because uh, you don't have the laser pulse. You can't uh, focus the laser pulse to such small area. Uh, this is uh, viol violating the, the diffraction limit and all physical laws. So this is just recalculation with respect to the one bit in, in the hard drive. But you can use actually some techniques how, how to confine the light in such small area and this is uh, this is uh, based on the plasmonic approach which means uh, the uh, pl uh, plasmonic particles which are the collective oscillations of the uh, charge density in some metallic materials and then if you will create such kind of shape for example uh, then in, in the middle where the size can be such small, you can then confine a light which will then sw switch, switch the magnetic material which is below, below this, this structure. So this is actually the road to the optical transi uh, transistor because you are using polarized light to uh, change the magnetic alignment of, of the material. And then this magnetic alignment will control your polarization of your light. So, and vice versa. So, so then it might be a possibility to, to, uh, to do the computer chips in the future, not based on the electric, uh, electronic, uh, uh, electronic transfer, data transfer or via electrons or by, via photons. So this is the end of this talk. I hope it won't, it won't be, it didn't, it wasn't so long. I, I don't have a uh, clock here, so I don't know. Uh, so I hope I showed you the magnetocryptical phenomena play an important role in physics. And they are actually quite nice probes to, to make a research of electronic and magnetic properties of, of materials. And then the novel, that the novel magnetoptical devices can, for example, help to overcome the uh, current physical limits of, of, the, uh, of the classical electronics or that the combination of spintronic concepts and magnetoptical phenomena can open the way to what we call spin photonics. So uh, at the end, I would like to introduce our group at the Institute of Physics of Charles University. Actually, this, this slide is, should be actually uh, changed because some, some of the students finished their thesis and, and left, but uh, mainly the data I show you was ta were taken by Lukas Beran and Eva Jesenska uh, from, from our group. So this is, this is all and thank you for your attention.
Okay, goodbye.
So, hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. Please, uh, my name is Peter and please welcome to my presentation about the software Wolfram Mathematica, which I will speak about for following few 50 minutes maybe or something like that. Uh, so, let's get straight into it. Uh, here is a quick overview of uh, what my presentation will contain. Uh, firstly, I will just briefly summarize what uh, Wolfram Mathematica is about. Uh, then I will, uh, this is like the main uh, message uh, of the presentation, if you are working with Mathematica for the first time, what you should expect and what it will look like. Uh, <coughs> I will also show some basic functionalities and uh, Op uh, operations and uh, functions which Mathematica offers. Uh, it will certainly be just a small fraction of everything Mathematica can do because that is a pretty large amount of things. Uh, they will, there will be a chapter about advanced features or like little bit advanced features. I might just skip that and leave it uh, for for the reference if you ever find yourself interested in that, you can download that later on and uh, look into itself yourself. Or maybe we will have enough time to go e through that too. So what is Mathematica? Uh, the best or one of the most interesting ways to answer this is to let Mathematica answer on its own, which I will do, excuse me, right now. And hopefully uh, you will see that it does something. Uh, what it actually, uh, this is one of the features Mathematica offers, uh, that it can interpret written language. It works in English, uh, only in English, I believe, right now. But it can interpret written language and do something about it. For example, if you put in a question, it can give you an answer. So Mathematica thinks it is uh, an all-in-one computation and visualization system, development environment, and deployment engine used across diverse technical fields, including engineering, science, and financial analysis. I would just like to add that you can use it for basically anything where numbers are involved anyhow, and they are even like outside of the mm, math, there is uh, lots of usage and interesting things you can do with Mathematica. Uh, <coughs> it was created uh, by Steven Wolfram, uh, in 1988. It uses its own scripting language called Wolfram language. And like the main selling feature of Mathematica is simple calculation. For those who have some, for those who, of you who have some uh, experience with, uh, with programming, you know that most common programming languages, what do they do is they use some variables, but they always at the end uh, the variables represent some numbers in the system while here Mathematica actually like computes with uh, or can do some uh, operations with uh, variables which are which do not have to carry any numerical meaning. I will show you later on what it means uh, but you will see it is very useful. Uh, I had to mention this uh, short comic strip uh, where they uh, compare uh, compare uh, programming languages to uh, to uh, to weapons uh, so you f uh, like uh, for example the first one uh, which refers to C like the mo one of the most common and basic programming languages is compared to a normal rifle if you know something about Java you know that uh, most like one of the most famous mistakes you can do there is a null pointer exception or one of the exceptions we can get there is null pointer exception which most often breaks the whole program so this is about the second uh, second picture and the third one this refers to Wolfram Mathematica uh, which if you couldn't read it for any reason says that Mathematica is a low orbit projectile cannon uh, it could do uh, amazing things in only uh, if anyone could actually afford one. So this speaks both about its strengths and its somewhat weakness that 
uh, Mathematica uh, is uh, extremely powerful for uh, many types of computations. The thing is, it is quite uh, quite expensive, so you can consider yourself quite lucky that you, if you won uh, the license in the uh, in the uh, competition. So let's get to do next uh, next uh, slide. So first, uh, if you open Mathematica, Mathematica for the first time, what it will look like? It will be I will just open uh, one new uh, uh, programming environment called Notebook, and it will just yeah you can't see that actually. Um, never mind. It will just be uh, completely blank. Uh, here I have added some background features and so on. Uh, but what is most important is that uh, you can just write there right away and uh, launch your or execute your commands. Uh, you, if you and you probably should try to save your file somewhere, you will notice that Mathematica uses its own uh, format uh, of files called NB for notebook. Uh, <coughs> compared to other programming languages which are often uh, executed from from first line to the last line at once, you can execute Mathematica commands uh, line not exactly line by line by, but cell by cell, where cell is a group of uh, of commands. You can uh, you can put it in, into each cell either one command or multiple ones. And if I go with my cursor to the right side of the uh, of the view, you will notice these frames uh, at the uh, at the very uh, right end of the screen, where there is this structure of frames I'm trying to highlight now, and these are the or like the uh, smallest one are the cells. So for example, if I highlight this one, so this is one cell which corresponds to to the to the uh, uh, to the to this big uh, uh, heading, uh, while there is uh, there is for example here another cell which corresponds to this text and so on. And if the cell uh, which it does by default, if it contains um, if it contains a Mathematica command, like for example this one. You can just execute it. Uh, this is you. You can do it by using these palettes or at the top of the screen. But the most straightforward way is to use uh, the shortcut sh uh, Shift plus Enter, which just repeats the expression for now. And this is the. This is because it works with A and B as generic symbols, which have no meaning now. So it just it cannot do anything interesting with them. But if uh, I, for example, want A to store the numerical value of integer two, I can mm, I can execute this line. So from now onward, A is two, uh, it is the same thing. But I can store in A, uh, which only a few lines ago was just a generic symbol over here, so I store there a number, but I can in the same uh, variable store uh, basically anything. For example, this black disk. So now a is, a is this black disk. And uh, so this is, this is connected to the last point uh, of the text. That Mathematica is strongly typed. Or actually, now I was showing that Mathematica is dynamically typed because you can change type of uh, of a variable at any time. Uh, that it is strongly typed means that you Mathematica will com uh, complain when you try to do something illegal. For example, if you try to make graphics out of a number which is not a graphic, so it will not try to do it somehow, but it will complain that you are doing something wrong. It will give you this big uh, red square. Uh, it is a scripting <laughs> language. Uh, Mathematica is a very high-level language, which means that its com its command its commands 
are quite advanced but do a lot of things you might not uh, be able to influence at, uh, like straightforwardly so this can have uh, th this is quite useful if you want to do something quickly but if you want to have greater control you might want you might need to do more work in Mathematica than in other languages Uh, of course, I've forgotten to I forgot to encourage you uh, to post any questions if you have uh, if you have them throughout the whole presentation. I will try to answer them at uh, the earliest convenience if at, when it will make sense. So now we have seen that Mathematica uh, uses symbols as uh, the important or this is like the the symbol uh, computation is uh, the important think of Mathematica and so we would like to uh, I will just I'm ju here I'm just showing uh, what all can a symbol be so it can be for example here you can see it, it can be a number it can be a vector a matrix function it's just kind of somewhat expectable but it can be also for example a plot of a function a geometrical object any picture and the and even a waveform of a sound you might even be able to hear, I believe. Uh, so, so yeah, that's uh, and there are actually are um, even more things. But this was ju this is just like apart from the sound, the rest is uh, what you will quite often encounter if you do mathematical things with Mathematica. So. Uh, as you might have, I will skip. Uh, I will go uh, one slide back, and just note, uh, 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 stress out this. For example, on this line, you can see that the A is in black, but B is in blue, and so I will go for, uh, next uh, back to the slide before, and uh, explain the colors. So some, if something is blue, it is like an unknown symbol. Uh, no information has been attached to it. While when it is black, uh, it has some meaning. Uh, if something is red, you are doing something wrong. And if something is green, uh, for those who know something about uh, programming, it's basically a local variable. It means that you cannot, uh, like, you cannot basically use it uh, out uh, uh, outside of some expression. And it, uh, I will show you later. That it is uh, it is a very meaningful thing. Uh, so now speaking about what Mathematica can do on its own without you, without you doing anything uh, This is extremely large amount of things uh, <coughs> You can you can offer or like or ma or built-in expressions uh, start with uh, Start with uppercase letters, so it is a good uh, uh, It is a good practice to write your own functions and variables with lowercase so you do not uh, interchange them. It offers quite a good auto-suggestion feature so if you write a few first few letters of an expression it will offer you to finish the expression if it already knows it. And uh, just there are about 6000 things Mathematica can do on its own everything from uh, everything from uh, adding numbers to showing some quite insane plots as I will show you later here's just a summary of basic operations uh, the most important thing is that uh, if you leave a space between two of uh, between two symbols Mathematica will understand that as a multiplication and uh, also here I um, show you that Mathematica can do all these operations in a symbolic way without A and B ha ha uh, be having to have any meaning. Another uh, very uh, important thing which you will encounter often is uh, the three types of brackets Mathematica uses or math many languages use them but Mathematica, Mathematica uses all of them quite evenly. Uh, parentheses, uh, 
uh, have has the same meaning as in mathematics, uh, which means the uh, it defines priority of operations. Square brackets, uh, they, these are even more important because into square brackets you put arguments of uh, functions. And curly braces, uh, these are connected to the basic data structure. So if you like want to work with many numbers at once, you put them with separated by comma into, uh, into uh, braces and work with them somehow I will show you later how. Uh, other basic features Mathematica offers is for example finding solutions of equations. Uh, here in this cell um, I first clear the meaning of A because it, remember is, it remembers uh, it from, from before. And then I solve this most basic quadratic equation in, in general uh, way. So you see that uh, in a little bit uh, strange form, but it gives you the correct answer you would expect. Uh, other basic things like Mathematica can do quite straightforwardly is integration differentiation. Uh, you see that the integration was ex as expected, uh, this, uh, apart from the fact that it doesn't add the integration constant, you need to work with, you just need to remember that. Um, differentiation exactly as expected. And here I uh, would just what's more like to remind that it would be quite hard to do some op uh, the operations like that in m like many other languages because normally you, it would be quite hard to explain to computer that what it should do when it should try to solve a quadratic equation, but Mathematica can do it in, in this very simple manner. Uh, another feature you can use is assessing, assessing the last outputs. So basically if anytime if you write uh, underscore and uh, execute it, uh, no underscore, uh, present sign, uh, and uh, execute it, you will get the last output. So if I attempted to make a, here a cell, uh, which ah, underscore uh, person sign, and if I make this cell to be uh, evaluatable, which I do for example like this, so the last output is x here. So I should, when executing this, I should get an x which it does. I'll just delete that. Uh, if you want to get the second last output, you can write uh, uh, more percent signs, or you can write percent sign and an integer and it will go that many uh, steps back. Uh, next to one of my favorite features of Mathematica is generating nice and informative pictures. You can do both uh, two-dimensional plots, he, uh, uh, as shown in the first picture, and three-dimensional plots as shown in the second picture. Uh, here just a quick few notes that um, if you want to manipulate the 3D plots you can just buy uh, without holding any key and just uh, dragging if with mouth you uh, mouse you can rotate the thing you can move it around uh, when you hold shift and uh, try to drag it and you can uh, zoom in if uh, and out if you hold out and move your mouse either up or down Um, another thing Mathematica is good as at uh, or can be good at is numerical computations even though it is virtually what you wanted to avoid in the first place Mathematica, uh, Mathematica uh, can do it also so for example uh, it has a, Mathematica has a very good approach to or very straightforward approach to arbitrary precision computations so 
if you, for example, are interested in a value of pi, with uh, f uh, and you are interested in the first 100, uh, 100 decimals, you just write here this n, which means numeric or numerical value. And when you execute this line, you will get first 100 uh, uh, figures of, uh, of pi. If you were doing anything uh, with numerics in Thematica, it is good to, uh, to remember that if you want to write 2 as an integer, you write it like this, but if you want to write it as a, as a float, a uh, floating point number, you need to uh, write it like this. <coughs> yeah, sometimes uh, you don't want to see an output of uh, some uh, some code and you just want to do it for example if you assign a value to some variable you don't need to know that Mathematica did that because because you know that you just uh, executed the line so uh, you can use a semicolon for that so here is for example some text and if I execute it you will see that you will just once more see the text because it is everything Mathematica can do with that but if I put uh, a semicolon uh, after it, uh, you will see that nothing appears because the output is suppressed. Okay, so when you know these basic operations, you might want to do them at uh, for many numbers at once. And for this, um, Mathematica deploys, employs, uh, the data structure called list which virtually is just ordered sequence or, or, or ordered set of the elements so here is in the first line there is a list of three numbers one two and three you could uh, you could define it also in this way it would be completely equivalent Interesting things that the lists in Mathematica can be non-homogeneous, which means that e that each element of the list can be of a different type. So, for example, this list it might take a few moments to load the picture. So, this list is on the first or the first element of the list is an integer. The second is an unknown variable. Uh, the third is a function and the fourth is a picture and it can just combine them and you can work with this as it is. One of the more common forms of lists is just a set of numbers. The easiest way to uh, generate such, uh, such a list is by using this command because it, uh, it the range 10 command uh, just produces all numbers from 1 to 10 or integers from 1 to 10. This is, use, this is useful for uh, in multiple occasions. Uh, I will start with showing you how to slice the list, which means how to take specific elements of the list. Uh, you always need, if you are slicing, you always need to uh, use double parentheses. And so if I want to just uh, and also on this line, uh, remember that I assigned to the A uh, this list. So uh, uh, this list is now in A. And so if I want to get the first element of the list, I will do this. If I want to get all the elements from the first to the third, uh, uh, this is how I want how I write it. I use double semicolon. And uh, Mathematica supports even this syntax, which means that I want uh, every element from the first to the fifth with a step of two. So I want every other. So from one to five, it will be one, three, and five. And this is what I get. If you have any previous experience with basically any programming language, you have probably been using lots of for loops, while loops, do, until, and I don't know what else loops. So 
Mathematica supports, then there is a command for it. But if you are using it, you are most likely using Mathematica wrong. You basically never need to use that. And there, it is good and bad in, uh, e it can be viewed as good or bad. The good thing is that you have many interesting and specialized, specialized functions, uh, which can somehow uh, do what normally a for loop does, but uh, these functions can do it better. On the other hand, you need to look for these functions a little bit, but I most often find it quite useful and uh, uh, and easy to uh, easy to approach. So, for example, if you want to get the squares of the numbers from one to ten, you just do, you just use this simple command, which will generate a will generate a list uh, on whose first el or whose elements are squares of the index number and the index goes from 1 to 10 so executing it will give the square of the first 10 integers or you can do uh, and this is like a very uh, a very big strength of Mathematica because it, because it can do it in very interesting and um, various ways is element-wise application of functions. So for example here without uh, without further comment I just define a function which uh, from a number returns a square. Here I uh, remind you that uh, that this command gives the numbers from 1 to 10 and so if I use this command which combines which you virtually says that use the function f of every element of the range 10 it will once more give the squares and obviously this, this might look not that efficient and you might be able to think of straight more straightforward ways to do this but uh, you need to uh, remember that you can use any function here not just this simple squaring function. So let's get uh, forward because the lists are strong, strongly uh, uh, closely related to vectors and matrices. S so in, in, the f in this three line cell, what I do is first I just once more uh, uh, clear the meaning of a and then you see that I have a variable called vector on whose right hand side I define I have a list so but but when you think about it this these two things are basically the same thing because list is a ordered uh, order sequence of uh, of elements and vector is also ordered sequence of elements so it makes sense to assign it like that and to also you see that I don't want to see uh, Mathematica doing that. I want to actually give me the on the next line. I want to make the list look more like more like a vector. So this this is basically just like formatting formatting the output to look better. But this looks like a very nice vector, and. What could you do with a vector? Uh, the most easy, uh, most easy, uh, or most straightforward uh, <coughs> operation is to do a dot product, which or scalar product, uh, which you use to um, measure the size or you base uh, or the square root of uh, of dot product vector with itself is its length. So. If you would do a scalar product of a, b, and c with itself, you would expect a squared plus b squared plus c squared, which is exactly what you get. Here, um, I define a matrix. On uh, on the right hand side, you see a list which has three elements, and each is a list of its own. So, it it makes sense to. Mm, just like this list of lists interpret as a matrix and if I put it into the matrix form so it looks nice you see that it is 
what we would expect if we would put this in the first line, this in the second line, and this in the third line. Uh, matrices and vectors are, ni are nice, but you might want to do some operations with them. So let's see what uh, the product of this matrix with the vector looks like. I would just like to know that the product is simply done by putting a dot between them. And if you think about it, uh, it is what you, would, what you should expect that the result is a vector with elements ax, by, and cz. I would just like also to rem uh, remind that if there is nothing in between those two elements, it means they are uh, they are multiplied. Another very common operation is to compute a determinant. If you uh, think about it and remember how it should be computed for this matrix. Uh, you will certainly realize that it is quite easy and should be the product of, of x, y, and z. And Mathematica thinks the same. Uh, I'm not sure if you have encountered it, but you can do many quite more advanced uh, computations uh, with matrices and vectors uh, in Mathematica, like finding, finding eigenvalues and uh, some deco uh, de decompositions, finding inverses of matrices, and so on. Mathemat Mathematica can do it all. But we don't have that much time, so I will just move forward. Uh, interesting thing about lists is that you can do uh, you can do element-wise operations. For example, if uh, you remember from the last slide that vector was A, B, and C, and I want to add one to each uh, of the elements, I do it just like this. So you see that you get one plus a, one plus b, and one plus c. I can do the same with subtraction, division, multiplication. And you can, because I said that lists can be non-homogeneous, so here you have a list which contains a sound and a plot. And you can just like add one to each of the elements. Mathematica will have no problem with that. It is questionable what this means, but you will certainly find uh, this is like to show that Mathematica can do it and I will leave up to you to think uh, of some maybe a little bit more useful, meaningful way to, uh, to exploit that. You will certainly have no problems. Another interesting uh, uh, feature of Mathematica you might use quite often is fitting. So suppose here that uh, so let's look at the command. So here is a list of two lists. This is the first one, and this is the second one. And so, and each of the uh, like smaller lists has two values. And if you just think of the first one as an x value and the other one as y value, it is a point in x, y plane. So you have two points here. And the fitting function, uh, you give the fitting function some functions, and it will try to combine them in, uh, in such a way that, they are, uh, that the f resulting function goes through these points. So if you have two points, the easiest way to join them is by line. So this is exactly what we define here. Uh, we give uh, we give the fit function two functions. One, which is based, which represents the constant. It will, Mathematica will try to add the one that many times. So the resulting function will be the closest to the, to those points given. And it will do the same with X. So it will do for example, a plus a times one plus b times x, and uh, tries to find the a and b, so it uh, so the function corresponds to the points. In the best way, if you would compute it, you will certainly agree that the correct result is two x minus one. Uh, 
let's get now from numbers to pictures. Mathematica supports quite a few predefined primitive graphics. For example, a point, line, circle, disk, polygon. From the little bit more advanced, for example, an arrow and there are uh, quite a few others. And obviously, one by one, they are not that interesting, but you can uh, you can combine them into a little bit more interesting things if you uh, if you want to. Another type of pictures you will encounter quite often using Mathematica is plots. Um, <coughs> you can have various types of plots. So let's start with if you write just plot, it means uh, two-dimensional plot. So you see that we are plotting tangents of x. And here you see a list of three elements. First is the variable, and then is the lower and upper bound uh, along the x-axis on which we plot. You also can notice that the x here and here, oops, I'm sorry, uh, has this greenish tint to it, which is what I was talking about earlier, that uh, it is like you cannot basically from the outside, you basically cannot access this x and redefine it and or use it for anything. And it's meaningful because you need to leave this x uh, untouched. So this plot function can do it with, uh, with it its own thing. And this is what you get and what one expects. You can do three dimensional plots. For example, here I have product of absolute value of x and y. You see that it is what you might expect that it is somehow bent on the x and y axis. Here uh, you can take a show. Uh, okay, I was first explain what it does and then you can take a guess what, uh, what it will look like. So this is a point in x, y plane. You might have seen uh, uh, this is its x coordinate, this is its y coordinate. And uh, those coordinates are parameterized by uh, this uh, parameter. And here you, uh, here you set f uh, the range for the parameter. And I will give you 10 seconds to think about it, what, uh, what it will look like. So if you were thinking of a half, half circle, you would be correct. Uh, here is a contour plot. So uh, it is quite closely, closely related to the 3D plot. In that, that in, uh, like in the 3D plot, you have two axes along which you take values, it is the x and y. And along the z axis, uh, you put a point basically that high, uh, what is the value of this function and uh, I hope it makes sense and in contour plot what you do is that you uh, uh, that you show the value of the function not by its height in the z uh, along the z axis but by its color so you see that along the x and y, uh, x and y axis uh, it is the darkest so it means the least the smallest value and it grows larger towards the corners. You can also plot, for example, a region. Here you have a region where x uh, squared is greater or equal to y. And this quite reasonably uh, gives you a parable. Just to note, Mathematica also suppresses uh, 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 supports quite nice network visualizations. And now I will start to getting to the little bit more advanced features, but I think at least this one is worth commenting. So what you are working with and what I am working with now, what you see is the notebook uh, while what uh, there is the second int integral part to Mathematica and it is the kernel which does the computation. So notebook is basically well formatted uh, command uh, set of commands 
basically a text file uh, while kernel uh, kernel is like the it is uh, basically a program of its own uh, which does the computations which delegates them to the CPU and uh, works with RAM and and remembers uh, all the all the results you've computed to some extent and uh, all the variables you use. Uh, here it is uh, uh, one nice feature is the parallel uh, parallel computation that you uh, if you have more multi-core CPU which is basically which is probably standard these days like at 100% of cases so you can launch uh, one CPU on each of your cores and uh, then you can make some computations quicker. It doesn't work every time, but in general you can, uh, at least working with big data sets, you can quite often use this to speed up uh, the computation quite quick, uh, quite a bit, and uh, use your CPU to its full potential. On the other hand, you sometimes want, you sometimes might want to Mathematica. Mathematica to forget something or forget everything. If you want to, f if you want to forget uh, something about only specific symbol, you, as I have already done, can use the clear command. If you want to clear everything, you can either do this. I will not explain how it works, but you can just like copy this into your notebook and uh, uh, execute it. Or you can just quit the kernel, and <coughs> Mathematica, Mathematica will forget everything. Uh, to do this, you go to the top of the screen into this evaluation palette. Uh, you go to the bottom of this list and we hear squid kernel and you just click on it. I will not do it now, it wouldn't hurt it, but I, I will do it now. But you, uh, you just <coughs> quit the kernel and uh, then you will note that everything is like a dark blue color which means that Mathematica has no kernel count currently available but uh, it will start a new one anytime you try to execute a command or you can just go here and start it manually uh, here and while it this might sound uh, for those who know something about uh, programming this might sound, this might sound quite cruel uh, it is actually quite a common practice to do with Mathematica, so you don't need to worry that you will uh, you will cause some damage with this. Just few other notes about, uh, for example, if statements is what one surely would uh, expect uh, a programming language to offer. So this here it is with quite straightforward uh, syntax. It is interesting that you can uh, give here this uh, other option, which means that Mathematica will do something even if the condition doesn't evaluate to true or false. Uh, interesting, uh, another thing is, uh, or like another quite potentially quite strong feature is this simplify and full simplify. For example, it can be quite uh, quite hard to press uh, to let the computer know that this expression of sine a cosine b plus sine b cosine a can be somehow simplified in other programming languages, but in Mathematica it is pretty straightforward. As you might expect, it will go straight to the conclusion that it is sine of a plus b. What you might, uh, what you certainly will use is, uh, or might want to use, is important importing and exporting. For these, there are these, there are these two uh, commands. I I don't think that the format option is necessary always. Uh, mostly, you need the path. Uh, and exporting, you need to say what you want to export about exporting uh, and importing into also uh, the Mathematica employs its own uh, its own data format which is called uh, which has 
which is abbreviated .mx or has the suffix .mx. So if you want to just like uh, take some data out of the Mathematica and use them later on once more, you should export them in this format. Uh, there is one feature, I, uh, one thing I don't like much is that Mathematica search uh, has a default path to search, like to export and import files somewhere here, uh, which is like e in your documents on uh, on your system disk or system volume, which is not what you might want it to actually do. So here is uh, quite a useful command which sets the directory Mathematica looks uh, for data uh, or where Mathematica looks for data it sets the directory uh, to be where the no no where your notebook actually is right now where is the file from which you are executing the commands it is to note that you need to include these two uh, uh, these square brackets uh, after this command because otherwise it will interpret it just as the name of the command and not uh, and will not evaluate it to the actual path you want to use. Okay, I will skip this one. It is actually pretty interesting how it works, but I will leave it to your own because it would take me quite a lot of time. But on the other hand, I if I certainly recommend uh, going through this and thinking about what it does and how you could use it because f at least for me it is one of the most powerful powerful features Mathematica offers. Uh, yeah, this, this is awesome, that important, you can have a look into that, what it does and think about why it does that. This uh, I will comment on this, uh, how to make functions. So. Uh, there are multiple ways to define a function. Uh, one is to use the expression function, uh, where you first put uh, the variable and then what the function should be actually like. Here I have basically done just uh, define just a nickname for sine of x. Uh, on the second uh, or on this line, uh, you can you can just like assign to the symbol f2 that if it is given with uh, if it is executed with one parameter it will uh, it will execute it as cosine of x so effectively it uh, is the same as using the function but it does something a little bit different if you are interested you can look into what exactly and i uh, one more uh, way to define uh, the we define a function is using a pure function where <coughs> you put these hashtags on uh, where you want the where you want the uh, variables or the uh, uh, arguments to go later. You can give them numbers, for example, if I wanted to make sure that there goes the first, I would just uh, put there the one, so it would be the first argument, and if I would put, wanted to put there the second, I would just write it two. So I will also execute this one, and now just to see that it works, uh, if I plug a pi into f1, I would expect a zero, the same for f3 because tangents of pi should be also be zero, and uh, if I plug pi into cosine, I should get minus one. So we will see if this list of the three functions called with specific arguments will give us what we expect. Yes, it does. Uh, here's like my f favorite part of uh, beautiful pictures Mathematica can provide. In the first one, you see some complex uh, uh, complex plane uh, plot, which is pretty colorful because it basically uh, it basically uh, the there are like the color has two variables: uh, its shade and its depth. 
or intensity, let's say. And these correspond to the phase and uh, magnitude of complex numbers. So, uh, so this is the first picture. The second picture you see there quite nice uh, dipole field. In the third one you see well-known uh, Mandelbrot set. The fourth and fifth are some vector fields in two and three dimensions. You can rotate this. Have a look at uh, the out outward vector field. Uh, this last one is for, was for me basically the most interesting because I found about this feature only when I was working on this presentation. You can have anatomical, if you're interested in anatomy, uh, for uh, you can have like the uh, uh, perfect mod uh, or high quality models of uh, of the human bones, for example, and I think there are also muscles and everything. Uh, and even it gives you the uh, tool tips with the names of the bones, so Mathematica can be also very useful as a uh, uh, as for studying anatomics if you are if you are a doctor or studying to be a doctor. So, if you find yourself lost at any point using Mathematica, the important question is where you get help. So, there are basically two uh, possibilities. For, uh, most straightforward is to uh, uh, denote or uh, to highlight what you are uh, what you do not understand. For example, this word. If I would understand, if it was an expression, I didn't know how to use it and press F1 or you can press F1 at any time and it will uh, open documentation. The documentation of Mathematica is one of the best I have ever seen. It will show you a lot of examples. It will explain every single option you can give to your functions very thoroughly. So use it as uh, every time you are not sure how something works. Uh, especially if you want, if you want to, uh, if you are not sure about specific function, if you want to do something more complicated, then you might need to go to the internet, uh, because it is quite it's quite likely that whatever is your uh, whatever is your problem, someone al already had it before. So you can uh, tr uh, just try to Google your uh, Google your issue and it will most probably send you straight forward straight to the stack exchange fora uh, where just search for your answer it is like 99.99% likely to be there if you are not asking for anything completely crazy so this is uh, everything from me thank you for your attention I hope you enjoyed this whole week this competition and the presentations uh, and before you run away I want, just wanted to ask you because I was showing uh, only the simple things Mathematica can do so I, would, I just wanted to ask you uh, uh, show you something more advanced and hopefully this will run in few moments and you can see that if you feel up to, hopefully, oh, no, I, I'm not sure how to show you the current screen. Okay, so, so just uh, when you return to this presentation, or if you ever return to this presentation, just run this last cell, it runs Minecraft. It is a very simplified version of Minecraft. It is not like full blown one point 18 or what is the last update but it runs simplified version of Minecraft which I find quite astonishing someone has uh, achieved uh, in Mathematica so now I, if I manage to close it yep uh, once more thank you for your attention and hope I hope you will uh, take part in this competition also in the next year.